there anyone else we are waiting for that we I thought winter would join us i'm holding my breath oh yes yeah. so. and i uh, yeah I, I was texting her a little earlier and so um she was excited yeah so we're there she is I see she's joining us face. now oh, who else do we want to join us let's <laughs> just invoke <laughs> <laughs> so Mike got to breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> Felt so welcoming in here. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> of course. All right. Well, let us call this meeting to order. Um, and I will start with um, our favorite ditty, um, the, the COVID opening statement. In keeping with the Oregon public meeting law, statutory land use hearing requirements, and Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the planning, Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding this meeting virtually. All members of the PSC are attending remotely, and the city has made several avenues available for the public to watch the broadcast of this meeting. The PSC is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, humor, flexibility, and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. And with that, I'd love to turn to um, items of interest from commissioners. Anyone? Well, I'll, I'll share one. Um, Jeff is uh, joining us in a little bit, but um, he is our liaison to the DRAC, um, which recently had a, um, a briefing on the um, the streetcar project, which we received a briefing on, I believe, if memory serves, early 2020, <laughs> um, and and was suggesting that uh, you know that it is that the uh, project is moving apace, and that um, it is might be a good question to consider um, when and uh, and how the PSC reengages on that project. So now I have carried water for Commissioner Backrack. Uh, and if there's no others, um, let us go to the director's report, Director Durbin. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you this evening. A couple of updates. Uh, one, we had the um, first hearing for the environmental zones uh, last week at City Hall. Uh, we had about 40 people um, sign up to testify, a robust conversation there. Uh, the team is working with city council members on amendments. Our plan is to bring um, any amendments and publish them in early April. And then we are scheduled to have a, another hearing on, any amend on those amendments uh, mid-April, April 14th. So just to keep you all apprised of that. And we have also in April, we expect to bring RIP 2.0 to City Council. Right now it's um, penciled in, not confirmed yet, but penciled in for April 21st. Um, also in April will be the opportunity for um, members of the public who are interested in weighing in on the budget process. There will be several budget um, community budget sessions. Um, and we will also be meeting with officers this week on Thursday to talk about how the PSC might want to engage and support uh, BPS's budget asks. So we'll, we'll have that conversation more. And then I just wanted to let folks know that um, we're all, of, as you um, see, we're experiencing a cold snap in Portland. Um, there's a weather emergency happening today over the next couple of days. The city is opening up um, warming shelters and is in significant need of volunteers. So if any members of the commission would like to volunteer or members of the public who may be listening, I would encourage people to go to the um, city website and sign up um, and help those who are in greatest need right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Durbin. And, and now going to the consent agenda um, and on the consent agenda is con uh, consideration of minutes. 
from February 8th. Would anyone like to make a motion to move? I make a motion to move, to approve the minutes. Right. Thank you, Olivia. I'll second. All right, Erica, thank you. Um, all in favor, can you raise your virtual or? Dun, dun, dun. Great, and thank you, Gabe, I see your virtual. Um, and that passes. And also, um, while his virtual hand is up, uh, Gabe, thanks once again for uh, representing the, uh, the PSC um, with e-zones before city council, that's great. Um, and with that, our um, first briefing um, is uh, from the Albina Vision Trust on the Albina Vision Plan. This is the third briefing that the PSC has uh, been lucky to receive on the plan. Previous briefings were held October 27th, 2020 and May 25th, 2021. Um, I believe it's uh, from Michael Alexander and Winter Johannes, I uh, offer the floor to you. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. And I was I was going to do just a really quick introduction, if that's oh, okay. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Please, Rachel, my apologies. That's okay. I'll be I'll be very I'll be very brief. I I, I promise, um, so that we can get the give the floor to um, Winta and team. Um, and good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Rachel Hoy. I'm a senior planner with BPS. And um, I, I just wanted to do a quick introduction to, uh, to Winta and um, her team are here to present their community investment plan. Um, and as uh, Commissioner Ross has already mentioned that they've been here a couple times before to um, present to the PSC. And today they're back with their completed plan. And the city has been collaborating and supporting AVT in their work for a number of years. Uh, this plan was funded by Metro with some supplemental funds from the city of Portland to support the community engagement process. And this has been a good relationship and collaborative process between Albina Vision and city staff. Um, we've met with them numerous times over the years, answering questions, providing guidance and data um, as they've proceeded through this um, community process. And um, ABT is going to be sharing their efforts this, and they already have started meeting with other commissions throughout February, and they have a meeting with Metro Council, it's a work session on March 29th, and a city council briefing on uh, March 30th. And um, this plan is, it's a vision, it's, it's a blueprint for Albina Vision's work moving forward. It's very similar. I, I would compare it to um, a framework or a concept plan that BPS would do for a large area. And um, it's coming to PC, PSC today to share their, they're coming here to share their report and give you progress on um, how this is moving forward. And so just to, one thing that I, you know, I wanted to point out, this is this is not the type of plan that would typically come before or that BPS would bring to the commission with like a, a full legislative process, but it is a plan. It's at that stage of what I would call a framework or a concept. Um, there are things for a legislative process that would still need to be done, like an infrastructure analysis, looking at compliance with the comp plan. Um, however, that type of work could be part of a next step in collaboration or partnership with um, Albina Vision in the future. And um, I think before I turn it over, Andrea, did you ha have a few words you wanted to just say about some next steps in that process? Sure, Rachel, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to reiterate a couple of points. Um, as Rachel just noted, this is a community-driven conceptual plan, which is different than what um, you normally work on. Um, today, AVT is coming to the Planning Sustainability Commission to brief you on the robust community process they've led and the resulting conceptual plan. And City Council will be determining and directing how the city wants to engage and participate in that plan. And that conversation will start when AVT comes to um, report on this work uh, to City Council at the end of March. Um, BPS and PROSPER and other bureaus are coordinating now and we're working together to seek clarification from Council and really to request a directive to coordinate and engage with AVT on this next phase of work to begin implementing their community investment plan. And so I'm excited to hear that we'll all have a chance to hear from um, the AVT, AVT team this evening and really wanna introduce 
and turn this over to Winta Johannes, the Executive Director of Albina Vision Trust and her team to walk us through the Community Investment Plan. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Director Durbin. Um, before we start, I have to acknowledge that Rachel has been such an integral part of this plan. And, you know, when we were uh, thinking about the community investment plan, it had many objectives, including getting more specific and um, defining the framework that was starting to be uh, defined. But the other outcome that we set out was really to start thinking about how community and government work together in a plan like this. Um, and so we've really appreciated the just the partnership. Um, and you know, Mike will have some introductory thoughts before we jump into the presentation. But what I want to point out for uh, commissioners this evening is that on March 30th, when we go to council, we're expecting both to report the plan um, and to have some kind of resolution that outlines next steps. And this is an area where we would really welcome your input is in helping us to identify what that could look like. Um, and the plan starts to point to some of those next steps, but I hope that we'll have time to, to discuss that in the end. Um, and then the last um, thing that I'll say here is that, you know, this is our third time to the PSC, and yet we learn and adapt after each one. And so while the plan is finished at this stage, it is a living, breathing plan. And so I expect it to continue um, to evolve. So we'll make sure to leave lots of room for discussion. So Mike, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, absolutely. Monta. Do our, um, are you going to bring up our presentation or can I just work independent of it? It doesn't matter. I can go either way. Yeah, I'll go ahead and pull it up while you give us the Fantastic. background. Well, there first we of all, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be in front of commission. I have not had um, the privilege of being a part of prior presentations to you. Although I, I know from looking at the representation in this group that you or the organizations that you represent have been in rooms with us over the course of the last four and a half years around a number of topics. Um, the one that we spent a significant amount of time on was the transportation bond for Metro, but there have been discussions around the Green Loop, there have been discussions around ways in which we promote uh, economic investment within Albina. And um, it's, uh, it, you know, I, I enjoy the fact that I'm in a room with people who show up in other rooms that have to do with the work that we're involved in. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you this evening and to just offer some opening comments. Um, as both, um, you know, Rachel and Andrea mentioned, this is not the standard approach to the type of community development initiatives that typically present themselves in the city. Um, we are we're talking about work and visioning and reimagining a community uh, in which we want to have an impact over the course of decades. And in many ways, it's the intersection of our vision and the scope of your charge that brings us to a discussion like tonight. When you begin to look at your stewardship of the comprehensive plan or looking at issues like climate action or zoning, those are long runway issues. And as we begin to think about how we want to reimagine uh, the emergence, the reemergence of Albina. Uh, it has to lend itself to visioning that takes us beyond the normal scope and timelines for many of the projects that we address as a city. Um, in looking at the description for the commission, you're charged with creating um, a better Portland of tomorrow. And we are looking to do the same thing. But a part of that, and I'm going to ask Winter to just advance to the next slide, um, is to look at that from the perspective of understanding how history, old history, creates a pathway for the creation of new history. This is the engineering. We just jumped off, but why don't we go too ahead, too forward? Well. That slide that you looked at was the 
group that we brought together, both in terms of our board and consultants, to help us to identify the pathway for what this community-driven process should look like. Our initial work began in 2015, and it was really allowing ourselves to think about what we and community and city and stakeholder groups would like to see as the envisioning of the reemergence of this community. What should it look like? How can it embrace the ability to reestablish the transfer of wealth from a community that had been intentionally disrupted over the course of a 50 year period? What should the 50 years looking forward look like in addition to the sobering reality of what the previous 50 years look like? Um, and so our history was to really think about how history can inform progress and planning. It's not that we're looking to revise history and it's not that we're looking to replicate it, but we are looking to have it guide us, to have it guide us from the perspective of how community can come together in a way that has them looking at a pathway forward, how we can begin to think about how acknowledgement of the path, healing and joy play into the work that we do. And how do we harvest the inputs from those of us for whom this is history and others of us for whom this is memory in terms of what this community had looked like and what it has the opportunity to re-envision itself to be. We had some beginning ideas and I, I love using the expression that we weren't constrained by reality. Uh, because if we're looking to do what is easy and what is quick and what is what I would characterize as low hanging fruit, that is a very different visioning than allow ourselves to step back and to think about the world of the remarkable. And that is what we have really focused on doing with inputs from many of the partners who were early in this work to sort of give us a conceptual framework to ask the right questions and then to bring together a group of consultants, both local and national folks who can help us to begin to think about what this space and place can look like in a way that is reflective of the progressive beliefs that this city aspires to but in many instances, a challenge to, to actually create. And that brought us into a room with a number of individuals and organizations and initiatives whose perspective was short-term and long-term in areas that would intersect within that. And so we look in putting together our community engagement strategy, 1.0 was reaching into the parts of the community that had been most significantly impacted, disrupted, and bruised by the history of the last 50 years to make sure that we didn't begin the story in the middle. We, we have to begin it. You cannot fix what you don't face. And we needed to face what that history was. But we also needed to have that guide us in the path forward. And that is the work of the community investment plan that we have provided some background to you on and that we want to be able to give you additional detail on tonight. Um, it is big work, um, but it is a big charge. And it is work that will take us over the known challenges we have and the ones that we identify as we go forward. It has been for us enlightening to identify the fellow travelers in this work. And we consider the discussion with this commission, a discussion with the group of fellow travelers. Um, it allows us to begin to think about how do we weave the fabric of the commitments that the city and Metro and other stakeholder and community groups and architectural firms and others have made to their path forward into the fabric that we believe can serve as the foundational guideline over decades for our Bonavision Vision Trust. And so that's the spirit of our time with you this evening. And again, in many ways, we've tried to bring together the thinking of people who are farther down this path than we are. They have looked at communities, they've understood what it takes to engage this, 
and to ask ourselves, how do we now begin to look at this long path of navigation, of stewardship, of funding, of alliances in ways that allow us to create the community that we aspire to uh, within Albina and, and quite frankly, within Portland and, and its uh, surrounding areas. So with that, let me step back and ask if winter and, and the, the biggest lift to us in the last two years has been the ability to bring winter on as as our executive director. You know, prior to that, you had five of us who were just doing the best that we could to manage this off the corner of our respective desk. And um, we've been able to absolutely get speed and height over the last two years through the support of our partners for funding, uh, you know, private and, and, and public sources of funding, but also being able to give greater uh, density to our strategy and to our efforts. So I'm delighted to be here this evening representing the board and uh, would uh, welcome having Winter take over the mic. Thank you, Mike. Um, and so as Mike uh, spoke to the anchoring principles of our plan, you know, one of the challenges here is really capturing both the magnitude of the damage that has happened in Albina and also the opportunities. So I think the growing support um, for the Albina vision work has been a reflection of the fact that our city is still very much grappling with, with these issues. Um, and so one way that the design team tried to look at this is to think about the financial impact of the, um, of the public policy and, and um, other decisions that led to um, Albina's destruction. So here's a rough estimate at the wealth that was lost from the neighborhood. We estimate that 800 homes uh, were, were taken and that the value of those homes in today's dollars is at least a billion dollars. And so this doesn't account for businesses and other quality of life metrics. Um, but it starts to help us think about just the scale of response uh, that it would take to rebuild. And it also helped us think about what kind of team could help us uh, think through this. So uh, it can't just be economists who are trying to build the exact same value. It can't just be architects who are making nice buildings. It can't just be community engagement professionals. Um, it's all of those. And, and so you'll see how that came out in our thinking. Um, but the biggest question that we really asked of the design team is to help us explore what it means for these values to be translated both on the physical site in terms of what's possible, and then translate that into wealth building strategies that can start to help to rebuild wealth, uh, particularly for uh, Black Portlanders um, whose wealth has been stolen for generations. And so to uh, approach the community engagement, um, as Mike alluded to, you know, there are a number of uh, audiences, um, but across all of them, it was important for us to root our strategy and our engagement in joy um, and in creative ways for people to be able to contribute. So I'll go over these quickly since uh, we've shared, this was the first part of uh, the work that we shared with you earlier. Um, but for those who are new, I'll, I'll quickly um, go through this part. But we hosted a number of arts and culture based events um, that honored both uh, memories and experiences and opportunities to connect, as well as uh, ways to promote um, people who are here right now. So whether it's promotion of uh, entrepreneurs or creatives through a film festival, uh, the workshops were not the only way to contribute. This whole process was really an ongoing dialogue to try to understand what's important um, and how do we reflect that in, in future plans. So the graphics you see here uh, were brilliantly illustrated by Kane Talton Davis, um, whose talents really helped to make sure that people knew the workshops uh, and events around this plan were inviting um, and to help us start to think about, you know, what is it, what is a black aesthetic and how do we start building that into the urban form um, so that the spaces we are creating are warm and welcoming and intentionally designed um, 
for the safety and prosperity of black and brown Portlanders. And so um, there were a number of workshops, which you can see the invitations for here, but through this process, uh, which happened entirely during the COVID era, which meant a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, we were still pleased to get a lot of uh, really meaningful and deep engagement. You can see uh, the numbers here, but what the numbers don't reflect is the quality of the conversations that we had. So each workshop was presented three different times, uh, one for Black Portlanders only, and then two more times that uh, were open to all. And in each workshop, uh, we attracted different um, demographics. And because there was no formal advisory group, it allowed people to constantly be able to come in and out of this ongoing conversation that was accessible. And so uh, we were able to hear from children as well as elders um, and sort of everything in, in between. Uh, and I know a number of you participated in our workshops, but Mike, as I scroll here um, through some of the images of the direct contributions, uh, I'll ask you if there's anything you wanna highlight about the uh, engagement process. I think that, um... The thing that stood out to us and, and we wanted to take full advantage of was to get inputs from as many streams of relevance and authenticity and perspectives from within our community. This is not an advisory board. There's um, other than Kay and there's no one on this board, you know, who has sort of been a part of our work. We had to explain what we did. We had to make sure that it had authenticity and relevance to the perspective as they brought. And we wanted to make sure that they felt comfortable and credible in extending this role into their networks and their spheres of influence. Um, this is a very diverse group of individuals, generationally, aesthetically, professionally from across our city. And I think it helped us each time we had to engage them in, in sort of serving as our were representatives is one, but it was more than that. There was a spiritual connection, there was a philosophical connection, and I think people felt very comfortable in bringing community and uh, communities of color and communities of conscience into this discussion in an authentic way. And, and quite frankly, in a way that allowed people to sort of be who they were and know that that was going to be of tremendous value to us. Um, and so uh, while there's this very uh, intentional and direct invitation for Black Portlanders to participate, we were also clear that this is a citywide, you know, this project is of citywide significance and we need all Portlanders to, to be engaged and to play a role. And so there were a number of uh, presentations um, and uh, workshops that we hosted with neighborhood groups, with uh, business groups. Uh, and so the, the engagement and the stakeholder was intentional, um, but broad, and we'd be happy to share more about that. Uh, but the presentations to the PSC um, were certainly a part of that as well. And so from this engagement, um, what we learned was that it presented an opportunity for, to really um, reduce the amount of filtration that happens from feedback to the point that, you know, design team members respond to it. So uh, our architects really held tight and made sure not to draw too soon. And even with the feedback that we heard about the kinds of spaces that people valued, um, that we capture the direct input as much as possible. So this graphic uh, represents what we heard uh, often in direct words, um, both in terms of the type of places that people valued, as well as the kinds of experiences. And we asked people to think about future places as well as uh, past or current ones that um, held significance to them to, to capture this. And so you can see there are five categories of feedback. One was that the future of albinus should cultivate a sense of belonging, that there needed to be a rich variety of public spaces, that there should be wealth built within the Black community, access to nature was important, and 
so was uh, shared social support. And so the team then started coding this, which you'll see when we get to the program um, in terms of housing, commercial spaces, hubs, which are the cultural connection points uh, and green spaces. And so as we show you, Again, um, the the richness of the feedback where, again, if you scroll into these particular bubbles here, you can see the ideas that came forward, everything from the importance of safety to spaces with uh, that were um, that promoted collective living, um, you know, open 24 seven spaces designed for teens. All of these kinds of experiences were important for us to capture so that we could continuously go back through this engagement and say, did we hear you correctly? Is this what you meant? And does this plan reflect the spirit of uh, the conversations that were happening in, in workshops and beyond? And so with all of this feedback about the types of experiences and places that people wanted, um, then we had perhaps one of the most important conversations uh, in this um, through our process, which is about density. And this was important because ultimately this discussion was about choice uh, and uh, especially with members of our community who don't have a lot of trust or you know, have not experienced choice in thinking about these issues. So uh, we know that high density uh, development has this negative connotation with gentrification and low density has this um, connotation with what used to be or what was taken. And so we challenged the team to think about how to really have a discussion about trade-offs that the community could actually have uh, publicly and in these workshops. And one way that we helped to do that was by thinking about the trade-offs associated with each particular type of density in terms of the overall goal here of building wealth. Um, and so when we did that, you can see these markers here start to help to break apart um, the benefits and drawbacks of each particular type of density. So it's not that one is good or one is bad, but each offers a range of choices. Um, and so with low density, for example, the drawback is that fewer people can actually benefit from living in that neighborhood. Um, but a benefit is that it's an easier entryway into construction, uh, for con especially for minority contractors to actually participate in the development of the neighborhood, whereas high density doesn't present that opportunity um, and yet more people can benefit from living in, in the um, housing. Of course, the other side of this is that the ownership opportunities are, are different. So um, in laying out the discussions here, though, what became really clear is that the site that we're talking about is so large um, that it presents the opportunity to think about density on the spectrum. And when we put it to the physical site, um, the site itself lends itself to different character zones, we started to call them, where you know we might strategically choose lower or higher density depending on the goals of uh, the program and also the wealth building strategy. So what we got from here is that, for example, um, on the southern end, where we're closer to the arenas, this may be appropriate for higher density, um, for higher density, whereas the value of creating a close knit neighborhood with medium um, density might be more appropriate on the northern end of the of this site here. And so thinking about it as a spectrum of options connected to the um, to the site itself led to some really fruitful conversations and ultimately informed uh, the strategy in terms of the plan that was developed. So the other important um, moment in the planning process was the recognition that there were two paths available to us. One was to come up with multiple scenarios for what could happen. Um, and the second option, which is what we chose, was to instead focus on, uh, on presenting the scenarios as phases for moving forward. Um, we were really surprised that in the feedback, you know, people were uh, less interested in swapping out, for example, 
a park here versus housing there, as opposed to saying, how do we actually move forward with a, a plan like this? And, and how can the phasing of it itself lend to the building strategies? So um, from that, we designated the, the next phases. So the first uh, phase of this, the catalyst phase, really focuses on the northern end of the site. And you'll see here that we started off with the low and medium density houses um, because that allows for um, opportunity for contractors, for example, to build capacity with the development. And so that itself uh, is a wealth building strategy so that we can have minority owned contractors able to participate in uh, the high density development as primes. Um, the other sort of considerations that went into this catalyst phase, there are a few strategic decisions here. Uh, one is that in focusing on, um, on getting housing on this site, we start to build the kind of community here. Um, currently, the only housing that exists is this building here on the far right. If you can see my cursor, uh, the Paramount apartment, which is the last standing residential building. And then there are there's a project we're currently working on next to it and one more that um, has been approved by the design commission. But outside of that, there are not residential uh, units in the district. So that's important. Um, the other important thing to, to accomplish in this first phase is to secure the waterfront park um, and establish it as a way to reconnect Portlanders on the east side to the river um, and for it to serve as a place for uh, events and community building. Um, in this first phase, we also see the introduction of the hubs, which represents the feedback that we heard in the workshops about making sure that we were creating opportunities for residents in this district to be able to benefit from resources, uh, as well as um, destination areas that we would create so that folks who don't live in, in Lower Albina will be able to come and participate in um, the neighborhood's activities. The hubs are also a way to generate economic activity um, and are part of the wealth building uh, tools that we'll share below. Finally, um, in the red line here, you can see the albino walkway. So we're thinking really intentionally about how we connect people from the green spaces along the hubs. Um, and then the final thing I'll say about the housing here on the northern end is that the issue of safety came up really frequently. Um, and so the decisions around this housing type were uh, designed to create those kinds of intimate spaces. Uh, we heard that people want the kind of neighborhood where everyone can keep eyes on the kids, where there's limited access points from cars. And so um, this campus style housing plan uh, is a direct response to that. And the transformation phase in, from 2031 to 2040 here, uh, we introduce a few more hubs. The food hub is placed here uh, to be connected to the activity from the arenas. Um, we emphasize Broadway, uh, bringing life back to Broadway and reestablishing it as a strong commercial corridor. Um, you can see the wellness hub incorporated here. And then on the um, top of the site here in the dashed lines, uh, we assume that the highway covers uh, will be built by then that reconnect Lower Albina back to North Northeast Portland um, and restore the street grid here. Uh, you'll notice that we did not place anything on those highway covers because there are separate and parallel processes, but we want to acknowledge the importance of, of those uh, covers for the, for the neighborhood itself. And so in the full vision image here, uh, the, the southern end of the district is built out here. Um, and in this graphic, you can start to see um, that there's a spectrum here that we aim to establish in the full vision where we have on the northern end more private 
um, an intimate space is really intended for neighborhood residents, whereas on the southern end of the um, of the district here, we envision active waterfront space. Uh, we really want to see Albina become Portland's front front door, uh, front steps. And so uh, large community oriented spaces, year round performance spaces that are dedicated. Um, we also wanted to call out some of the direct input that we heard in terms of people being able to have access to views um, uh, and that being uh, widely shared. Um, and so the type of green space really uh, follows that spectrum where here you have um, you know, neighborhood parks, community gardens, and playgrounds. And then as you get closer to the arenas, um, the larger spaces. And so before I go into this next section about the hubs, um, Mike, is there anything you want to highlight? I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I, I think went to what, what has always been very helpful as I think about this is that we're, we're not constrained by the polarity of either or. As you mentioned early on, it's sequencing, it's looking at who can be brought into this at the time that makes the most sense. And, and quite frankly, we know that we will either witness or influence what the development of this area looks like. And we need a long enough conceptual and theoretical framework to be able to bring the right stakeholders, the right investors, the right developers in at the right time. And to have them have a sense of confidence that they will be anchored in a space, in a place that is that is organic and that will continue to evolve and develop. And so I think that's been um, both the opportunity and the obligation of this, this particular uh, community investment plan. Thank you, Mike. Um, and so just one uh, more note about the hubs that you saw represented in the yellow. So, um, you know, we envision at least four hubs that are focused on the areas that were identified by community members as being important. Uh, and each of these hubs represents an opportunity to bring together partnerships to, de to deliver ongoing programming services um, and opportunities. Along with that, you know, one of the great opportunities here is actually in the naming of the spaces uh, and places that will be created. So um, what you see here uh, are placeholders, um, but we envision that there would be ongoing community engagement so that we can uh, make sure that the place, not just in buildings, but in the actual names reflects um, the culture and the legacy of what Albina represents, um, both for newcomers and uh, those with, with generational roots here. Um, but this exercise itself was powerful in, in our workshops for people to um, recognize I think the importance of building both place but building community um, with that. And so, so the, if I could interrupt for just one second, that that slide with the naming conventions. Um, to anybody who's ever traveled to Australia and New Zealand, when you land in those airports, it's a very different experience. Uh, when, when you land in Australia, it is clearly colonial influenced in terms of the naming, the everything. When you go to New Zealand, from the time you touch down, the impact of Maori culture is in front of you every step of the way. The airport, the naming configurations, the routes, the convention centers. It, it, it is so reflective of an acknowledgement that that history needed to have been re-embedded in their path forward. And in some ways, it's also testimony to the fact that there cannot be restorative justice without restorative recognition and restorative economics. Um, they, they come hand in hand. So I think when we think about this, it is to be able to weave the resiliency and the history of this community into a future that is going to be reflective of multiple influences. 
Thank you, Mike. And that's a beautiful introduction um, to the last slide here in the cultural connection section, uh, which is that, you know, one of the values uh, established by the AVT team early on was that, you know, one of the outcomes of this vision has to be an honest uh, reckoning with the past, but in a way that moves us forward. And so, um, the team proposed, uh, as opposed to um, memorials or dedications to what has happened, the idea of monuments um, that speak to specific uh, experiences, uh, history, and aspirations for the future. So you can see uh, in this image some of those ideas that have started to emerge um, that help us to, again, be honest about what's happened in Albina, but uh, think about these monuments as a site as sites that are forward um, forward looking. And so the last section um, here is about wealth building. And so we know the what has happened in terms of wealth loss. Uh, we looked at the opportunities that the site presents. But then the question is, how do we make sure that people benefit from this and that we put forward a model? Uh, for development that allows for wealth to be cy cycled in the community. Um, and so the team expressed this through these wealth building stories or case studies. Uh, and each of these profiles came from the community workshops where people were asked to think about um, who they'd like to see in this plan. And this was helpful because then it, uh, our team was able to then think about the kinds of tools and partnerships that AVT would need to pursue to make this possible in, in coming years. Um, and so I won't go through all of these, um, but you all have access to the presentation. And so I, I invite you to, to spend some time with this. Um, you know, we talked about contractors as one case study um, and how the phasing of the development is one of those wealth building tools. Um, and so you can see how those tools come online at different phases. Um, and, you know, that, that this um, in many ways will rely on what's happening in the district, um, but other uh, supports that exist outside of the district. Some of the, um, some of those case studies here speak to the different kinds of opportunities that we want to create. So if you are an elder who's remained in the community, how do we think about your contribution to the future success of the neighborhood um, and different tools, which include the opportunity to invest um, to invest in, in the future of the development here. So you can see that here, um, you know, what does this mean if you are a professional uh, who's moved here recently um, and you can actually be a source of capital uh, as well. Um, and so in, with Nichelle here, for example, uh, we have her in the pl uh, planning and catalyst phase uh, being part of um, operating maker spaces and incubators for local entrepreneurs. And so um, I will just move here through these quickly. Um, I think it's important to highlight the Turners, which speaks to, again, um, Mike's point that the plan is not about either or, but making sure that we have a full spectrum of tools. You know, what does the plan like this mean if you have been displaced to East County and have no interest in actually living in this district? Then, what kinds of um, tools might we uh, might we have? So, for the Turners, um, you can see here that we envision different um, ownership interests that they may have. And so taken together across these case studies, this is the compilation of wealth building tools. And really the charge here for the team was to think beyond home ownership um, and to think about how we intentionally weave together home ownership with employment, community resources, entrepreneurship, and uh, establishing ownership interests um, that everyday people can participate in and thinking about it across uh, the phases for this plan. So 
to make this possible uh, that, you know, our team will need to continue to do more work on governance, really to figure out what the model is that allows us to capture wealth from development and reinvest it back into the continued development of the district. Uh, but as you can see in this um, outline of what that will look like, we're in the build the foundation stage. So the, um, the next step is really to facilitate future governance uh, discussions and work. And so the board is starting to think about what that may look like, but taken together, uh, we hope that this has given you a fuller picture of how the plan is coming together, uh, the opportunities that are before us, uh, and then the areas where we can take immediate action um, to you know, affirm <laughs> that we're going in the right direction and that, um, you know, that we need to take the next step. So Mike, any closing thoughts before we open it up? You know, the closing thoughts is that this is big work um, and it will take many hands to sort of put in it. But, you know, I, I do a couple of things when I think about this work. One is to imagine what it must have felt like 50 years ago as we began to see the disintegration and disinvestment within this community and how that was um, clearly not an intended outcome, but a, but a lived reality that we are facing now. We have the opportunity now to cast that net forward over the next 50 years. And you know, I use the expression that we are being asked, we're being given the opportunity to plant trees whose shade we will never see. Uh, but they will be a part of hopefully the lived reality of this community going forward because we had the commitment, the vision, and the audacity to think about what could happen if we did not constrain ourselves to the reality of today. And we have that opportunity. Um, we also appreciate the fact that we have the chance to speak to groups like this commission, who are also looking at big work, but they're looking at work that will take place over multiple years and in some cases over decades, um, so that the intersectionality of that is not lost on us. So your thoughts, the filters, the guidance, the insights that you can bring can only support, the, I think, the richness of the indigenous wisdom that we've been able to gather through this community investment process. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing to navigate down this path with fellow stakeholders. And with that, Commissioner Rouse, we turn it over back to you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, and I am uh, three blocks from my home. Uh, um, I'd love any commissioners' thoughts, questions. Oriana, John L., and Eli have their hands up. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm assuming maybe you can't see that. Uh, I cannot see it. I will be able to see it in three minutes. Oriana, please. Uh, Janelle was before me. So. Oh, forgive oh. me, Janelle. <laughs> Good heavens, oh. thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, Mike and, and Winta, thank you for uh, that uh, terrific uh, presentation. It's uh, inspiring what um, ABT has been uh, up to, uh, both in terms of uh, community engagement as well as what I think is a, a very compelling, um, not just a, a theoretical framework, but uh, a framework by which um, uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, secure uh, the needed investments to realize. And so I uh, just wanna thank you all for your leadership um, in reconstructing um, or deconstructing uh, sort of a dichotomy that um, has caused uh, so much harm and pain for uh, so many African-Americans. It's, it's nice to uh, have uh, something positive uh, to uh, look forward to. So uh, just want to thank you all for your leadership and uh, your engagement. John, if I can, I, I also, before you came on, I want to acknowledge that uh, we have also had the privilege of being in rooms with people who are looking at comparable issues to this, and, and you've been a part of those rooms. Um, and so bringing that perspective into this space, I think, can only be additive with that of your colleagues. So thank you very much for those, those comments.
Thank you, Oriana. I want to uh, echo that gratitude for just the the truly big and thoughtful, but also very intimate vision that um, is being put forward, um, and the incredible leadership that it takes to be able to think in that kind of both expansive and intimate level. Uh, one thing that really stood out to me was the really incredible graphics. I can't remember the name of the artist who designed them, but uh, talking about kind of cultivating that black aesthetic. And in the work that we do on this body, I'm thinking especially back to our um, design uh, overlay process. One of the issues that came up was the idea of culturally specific design and design that made people feel welcome was I think the phrase that that you use. So how would you how would you ask us to take some of the lessons that have been drawn from this process and this work, either from a process perspective or a design perspective? or a planning perspective, how would you like to see us learn from this project as, as a body and in particular as a mostly white body um, to, to help engage and make sure that we are cultivating spaces and planning and processes that help people to feel welcome in this work? That's such a good question, uh, you know, and I, I have to uh, say the artist's name again, it's Kane Talton Davis, who's also um, done an incredible mural in the new Portland building. And so, um, you know, I think that the reason that this, the graphic language that she put forward really spoke to um, people we interacted with is that it, it both touched on something familiar, but also something new that the that this is about the possibility and the creation of what doesn't exist yet. Um, but that came from the constant conversations that we were having. So, you know, Commissioner Bell, I appreciate your comments, and I hope you can see in this plan some of your own contributions, even if you know indirectly. And and this is true for so many in our community. So, I guess the feedback um, that I have about how to integrate what we've learned from this lesson is that there have to be processes that are open enough to allow for continued dialogue and continued engagement outside of any rigid sort of meeting structure or advisory body or whatever um, the structure we set is. And then um, as, a, as a body, I think um, we really try to expand our thinking about what was technical, you know, um, so many times we think about community engagement and the graphics associated as the fluff, uh, whereas the real work is happening somewhere else with the architect team or with the economists or so on. And what we um, said in this plan is that the community engagement is the technical work. <laughs> it's the balancing of, you know, aspirations, dreams, pain, all of these things um, in a way that keeps us moving forward. And when you recognize the community engagement is technical, you invest in it differently. Um, and then it actually changes the work in real time uh, constantly. So our economists were constantly challenged by our engagement folks and, and so on um, within the team in a really constructive way. So I hope that that helps, but um, Maybe my my real answer is that we're also still experimenting and, and figuring it out too. Thank you. Um Eli. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the awesome presentation. I'm I'm gonna um I'll especially appreciate the naming of things. I think early naming is a great idea for the plan. Um, and I'm I'm going to make my ignorance on display here though because I don't quite understand the how far north does we you share that rendering of like the different stages of development is the northernmost extent of that Hancock Street or further north than that it, can you answer that and I've got to find me a follow up how how far north is your does the does the does the vision go so really basic yeah it goes past um, so past the Portland Public School site building. Um, so let me, I, I'll pull up a map while you ask your next question. Okay, sure. Well, because I think it's a probably it's never been done before to um, and brilliant, you know, to set up zoning for the intensity of the development based on the phasing desired to build build wealth intentionally. Um, but that's definitely not the way this site was zoned 
in the past, right? So there's a mix of um, IG1, EXD, and CX in this area. And so I'm, and I'm partly asking this as a question is um, how much of what you propose is aligned with those zonings and how much do things have to change? And we know that later on in this meeting, we're going to talk about the economic opportunities analysis, um, which has a lot about IG zones. So if there's um, something we should have in the back of our minds as we look at um, industrial zoning, um, because some of this area might need to be freed up from industrial zoning, then that'd be great to share. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and we have a zoning map. So as part of the analysis, the team provided a parcel by parcel breakdown, as well as, um, you know, taking the entire district and, and putting the current um, zoning on top of it to help us start to identify where those areas of focus are. I know that the BPS team is starting to do the same as well. Um, so Rachel, I don't know if there's more you wanna say on that. Yeah, um, we are starting to take a look at, and took a close look at the, um, the zoning analysis chapter that was done. Um, you know, I think commissioner's feedback, there's, there's actually, so there's EX and there's some open OS, open space zoning, CX. Um, the the um, most of the area along the waterfront, except for the grain terminal, which isn't part of it, is OS. So they're, they're at this point, you know, we're still looking into it. I don't know that there's like a zoning issue per se. Um, or, you know, the adjacent property that's just to the north of Blanchard is industrial. So okay. there's a there's a border with um, industrial zoning. Oh, so it's not extending into the IG area that I see on the map north of Hancock? Yeah, just north of Blanchard is, a, a, it's actually a water bureau property, mm -hmm. and it's um, IG1. And is that part of the vision area being, or not? Okay. No, so that that formed our edge, and I was trying to pull up the zoning map for you, um, but I'll have to send it to um, to Julie afterwards. But that that formed the northern um, edge of the district. Thanks, that helps. And if you if you have that zoning map, maybe after the meeting, just kicking it out to commissioners, that might be helpful to see how how far it goes. Thanks. Thank you, Erica and, and Valeria. It's wonderful to see your hands and your faces. Um, I'm really grateful uh, for the opportunity to hear about this project. And the presentation was amazing. Um, the graphics, I was very just blown away by them. And um, the level of imagination and optimism um, you know, balanced with the sober reality of this site's history um, really impressed me. And I guess I'm wondering, um, I know this wasn't the focus of your presentation today, but uh, what your your most imaginative or uh, optimistic uh, vision of the regulatory um, mechanisms or the policy mechanisms um, might look like that could support some of this. And I know that you had uh, a few things on one of the last slides before you closed that maybe started to um, to address some of that. But if you'd care to elaborate on that or just to talk about some of the ideas that have been floating around that can, can help to realize this. Yeah, I'll start here and invite Mike to add anything I may um, miss. But, you know, the most imaginative part of this for me is that the vision exists and that it continues to build uh, momentum. You know, this is a site where the relationship with public sector partners in particular is complicated because of, of what's happened. And so, um, you know, we're not ready to dive into... Um, the specific regulatory uh, framework that we'll need. But what we need at this stage is an acknowledgement 
that it's a partnership where the power balance is different than what it typically is. And that uh, one of the outcomes of this partnership is actually building trust um, for not, you know, one organization or one group, but community-wide that this, this is an endeavor um, in building civic trust. And so that's the overarching question for us. You know, I think over the last few years, um, the AV, the Albina Vision team and, and supporters have been able to assert um, sort of a, a moral claim to the district that has helped to guide decisions. And now this next phase uh, is thinking about what are the regulatory tools to support that. And that, you know, includes power sharing in different ways. Um, and so is there philosophical agreement that that's the path forward? I think that's the question uh, more so than any particular kind of decision. And then maybe the last thing I'll add, 94 acres is huge and this is a widely, you know, complicated site. And so, you know, it, it will take a wide range of um, of approaches, which is why we've really focused on the building the foundation as the immediate next step. Uh, there's no sort of regulatory framework that we can copy and paste from anywhere else in the country, you know. And so uh, we, you know, we looked at precedents for nearly a year, and what we'll have to do is, you know, fit something together that is specifically, you know, that is specifically designed for this neighborhood, this city, the state. So what that will look like, we'll have to figure out together. Thank you. With, um, I think Winter is spot on. I, um, you know, as, you know, as a social scientist, I, I tend to think about this, I mean, the analogy that I would draw, and it's a bad one, and I apologize ahead of time. But um, you know, I, I think about the Vatican as a very small and defined place. But there are a set of commitments that anyone who occupies business, commerce, civic within that space has got to be conformed to. And so as we look at things like opportunity zone investment or codes of zoning or development, there has to be a North Star that people are willing to sort of focus on and then do what they do and hopefully do it well and do it to the advantage of the broader community. But there are constraints that say there's an alignment in terms of mission here or there's not an alignment in terms of mission here. And I think we will draw from those folks for whom no explanation will be needed and we will not draw from those folks for whom none will suffice in terms of why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you. Valeria. Thank you so much. I will echo the gratitude by fellow commissioners. Um, your presentation today does astounding. And in my own, um, in that vein of imagination, just um, the ability to have this be a model for um, what could happen in other parts of the country is really, really exciting. So um, thanks for you know, leading and being at the forefront of that. Um, I had a question related to, um, uh, you mentioned in the document that you provided, the executive summary, there's a closing neighborhood that would be a car-free zone. Um, how big is that within, you know, the 94 acre site? And also um, on that note, what was some of the, um, uh, thoughts from the community around just transportation and connectivity and um, yeah, ba based on some of the models of density, you know, one can't help but to think some of, about, you know, parking, um, not to, you know, limit the imagination, but just wondering, yeah, um, what did the community have to say around that? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about transportation uh, from lots of angles. So I'll start you know, with the close-knit community, that northern um, part of the district. You know, much of that is currently the Portland Public Schools headquarters site, uh, which takes up 10, uh, it's 10 and a half acres. So if you can imagine about 10 city blocks 
Um, and so uh, because we've identified that as the catalyst phase, uh, this next part for us after the community investment plan uh, is the next planning effort <laughs> focused on that, um, that edge. So we have the numbers here about the amount of housing that we envision there uh, and the first hub that would be there, but um, there's more work to do. I think that the uh, discussions about connectivity though were interesting because you know, the, our planning process was happening alongside uh, the I-5 project. So in our workshops uh, were also discussions about how transportation projects have not served this community in the same way that this neighborhood was seen as one to go through as opposed to uh, where do we make the intentional connection. So let me pull up the transportation map here, but the, um, the specific decisions that were made included the neighborhood walkway to connect the hubs so that uh, residents could easily access the, um, the, anchor, the anchoring parts of the neighborhood. Um, you know, the circulation um, decisions were important because it identified Broadway as where commercial activity would happen. But on that northern end, uh, the safety was not just from cars in terms of, you know, of, of auto traffic, but there's this sense that cars um, also uh, are related to surveillance or otherwise uh, intrusions into neighborhoods. So we try to think think about how to make that a quieter um, part that really encouraged pedestrian and active um, transportation as a form of community building itself. Uh, and then we also talked a lot about how the green loop uh, intersects with the site. So how do we think about um, that again, not sort of cutting through the neighborhood portion, but being a well integrated part of the district that's welcoming, you know, Portlanders into the district, um, as well as creating connection points between the residential and commercial uses. So uh, I'm sorry I've closed this presentation. I was intending to share it, um, but I uh, I will try to point that out. Um, and it's in the yeah, it's a, it's it's in the documents. Forgive me for my screen share issue here. Did that answer your question? Okay. Winter, if I could offer just an addendum to that as well, because you're, you, and you're, you're, as always, you're, the breadth and depth of your response was just great. One of the, the, the beautiful points of this community engagement is that periodically there would be what I call the next concentric circle of discussion around an issue. And when we look at the, the issue of the housing and density, it also introduce for some people the thinking that, you know, maybe we can purpose some of this housing to be workforce housing. If we think about entrepreneurs who are in this space, if we think about the focus on a child-centered and an education-focused initiative, then can we introduce now the concept of maybe having the people who are going to be about that work be a part of these residents so that they're not getting into a car? I mean, they're not going halfway across town. Um, that there's workforce housing for the, the teachers who we want to look like the children they're teaching to afford to live here. Um, so, I mean, I think there, there are open areas of potential exploration that while we haven't sort of hotwired them in, they are certainly not off the table by way of consideration with other things that could be a work product from this space. Thank you. And I would love to ask a, a last question as we, we reach the end of our time. Just one, uh, echoing others, thank you for this generosity of time and for this wonderful presentation. And oh, we see it. Oh, oh. <laughs> there's a lag. Well, there's the transportation map. I, <laughs> I will share it after. I didn't mean to interrupt there. No, would you like to share it now? Well, I will be very brief. Jeez. Um, so you, you can see here <laughs> the plan for connecting um, throughout the site and how, uh, you know, the, here's on the northern end, the uh, close-knit community, and then where we have the busier um, 
the busier streets versus the uh, neighborhood walk and greenway and so on. But I will send this along with the zoning map for you to take a closer look at. And then, um, you know, the last note about parking, uh, it's one of those, um, one of the areas we've had to contend with is the fact that those giant parking garages you know, have replaced where there used to be community. And so one of the things that we have to balance is the need for um, adequate parking to support the fact that this is an events district with uh, thinking about what parking will look like in the 21st century. Um, and so there are some ideas about that as well that um, you'll be able to look at. So sorry about that intrusion, Steph. No, that was that was great. I mean, uh... As a former executive director of Oregon Walks, I really appreciate walkability. <laughs> and I am ready to go on the Gordley Carter Walk. Um, uh, you've invested, just in the last few minutes, um, you've invested now three briefings worth of time with us. And uh, as, as I think we talked about at the very beginning, this is a, a different process than um, particularly uh, city-initiated or bureau-initiated plans. Um, between how can we um, how can we be involved going forward? How can we support your work going forward? Thank you for that. I'll I'll give the specific answer, um, and I'm sure Mike will have more to add here. But uh, you know, specifically thinking about the next milestone uh, in this work for us is the March thirtieth presentation to council. So, you know, while we've had great partnerships, both uh, at the Bureau and elected level, there has been no formal acknowledgement um, that Dyna Vision work exists at all. And so we seek to change that on March 30th with the acceptance of the report um, and then the actions, you know, that the city will commit to at that time through a resolution. So you're having, um, you know, a letter of support from the PSC would be incredibly appreciated. Uh, and then as we shape, you know, what that resolution will be, um, both with um, bureau and elected staff, uh, I'd be happy to share that and um, any additional feedback or ideas you may have again, that established that we um, are taking the next steps of this partnership together would be um, helpful. As I mentioned, you know, our next planning phase is focused on that northern uh, end of the site and establishing that as a close-knit neighborhood. The other really important part is securing the waterfront park uh, and, is, you know, asserting as a city that that is a value uh, that we will plan towards, not that we have all the answers for, but that we're moving in that direction. Um, and so those are the kinds of specifics that we're working to uh, define over the next few weeks. Um, but your uh, support as we head into that process would be very appreciated. And then longer term, you know, March 30th is a blink of an eye <laughs> um, when we talk about the fact that this is a 50-year plan. So We'll ask for um, ongoing and uh, deeper levels of engagement, including in the work to define what the potential strategies uh, and partnerships are to keep this moving forward. Mike? You know, <clears throat> I, I fully support 100% of what you say. And I think the only other response I would offer is to also think about us as a partner as you begin to move your work forward. I mean, much of the, the opportunity that I've had to, to work with your organizations and several of you has been around issues of shared concern, whether it was transportation, whether it was our drawing on elements of the comprehensive plan. And if there are ways in which what you have seen and heard today give additional traction and height, velocity to your work, bring us into your space in the way that, that we have quite frankly, invited you to join us in ours. Um, because again, we don't look upon this as being a singular effort that's you know on the periphery. This is embedded within the DNA of what we would like to see this city look like and be guided by over decades. And if we can support that, 
then that, that will only work to the benefit of our Bonavision Trust and to the equitable distribution of quality of life enhancements across the city and the region. So please think of us as, as again, that fellow traveler when what we aspire to do coincides with the things that you're charged with stewarding. Thank you. Um, thank you both. And Rachel, thank you for your grace um, as I got the intro wrong. Um, uh, to, to the question, and I know that we're, we're a tiny bit over time, but um, um, we do have precedent of, um, without a, a, a formulated plan, but uh, recognizing like uh, supporting a process. Um, I believe if I'm understanding correctly, um, we have recent precedent of, of saying that we would uh, be happy to write a letter um, in support of the build shift process. I wonder if that is, um, if we would be supportive of writing a, a similar letter and and work with, with Rachel and team to to draft that for consideration in the next few weeks. Would that be throwing out a concept? I'm seeing Oriana with a thumbs up. Seeing thumbs up, thumbs up. Um, maybe we can just take a, a like a quick virtual or overarching. And I'd support that as well. This is John L. Okay, thank you, John L. Okay, um, then we will work on that. Thank you all very much. Uh, this was lovely, and we'll look forward to. I'll, I'll look forward to looking at those slides when they aren't on my phone, uh, going from Portland State University to my house. Um, uh, and with that, we will turn to uh, the economic opportunities analysis. Um, and Tom Armstrong, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. All right, good evening. Um, we are here tonight uh, with the first of probably many briefings and discussions about the um, economic opportunities analysis, otherwise known as the EOA. And I'm here this evening with, um, oh, she disappeared, Rachel Hoy and Steve Kuntz who are uh, part of the um, EOA team here at uh, BPS. And um, we will have, um, we have a, a presentation for you tonight that's really in three parts. Uh, uh, first, a short introduction and context and framing for the EOA. And then Steve is gonna go through some um, data uh, charts, uh, much of which was in the executive summary report that we sent out last week. And then I think at the end of Steve's presentation, we'll pause there for some um, questions, uh, clarifying questions. Uh, and, and then um, after that piece, the final piece will be um, uh, Rachel will get into sort of our uh, community engagement process and what's going to unfold over the next six to nine months here as the sort of the early um, public facing stage of the EOA. So I'm going to share my screen with our presentation. And um, And we'll get into it. Um, so, as I said, you know, we want to give you some context about what what is an EOA and what our goals are for the project. Um, Steve's going to review some recent market trend data uh, with you, and then we'll talk about the outreach process and and sort of where we're starting from. Um, the starting point for that outreach process with some conceptual scenarios and evaluation framework that um, will be the focus of our initial community discussions. Um, as we go through this tonight, um, we'd like you to keep in mind some, uh, some discussion questions that we can take up at the end. 
uh, which are, you know, do we have the right project goals for this update? Um, and we think some, some of the key issues um, have to do with uh, equitable economic prosperity and what that means um, to you. And, and that's a question that we're gonna be asking the community. Um, at the same time, um, what, what does a sustainable resilient economy mean? Um, and, and those are sort of two key concepts that, that we're gonna wanna define um, through this update process. And then any other um, questions that you have about the future of Portland's economy, I think one of the things that uh, that makes it a little difficult those are those are very wide open questions um, in terms of that sort of what what we would call and what the the state wide planning rules calls the economic vision um, for Portland. Um, but what is required of us by the statewide planning goals and rules is that we demonstrate that we have a 20 year growth capacity um, to accommodate ex expected um, employment growth. Um, we have a, a recent um, regional forecast from Metro that was used for their urban growth boundary analysis. That's been allocated to um, the local jurisdictions. And so that's what we use as a starting point. Um, and then from there, um, we get into more detail in terms of not just total jobs, which is about um, uh, 82,000 new jobs out to the year 2045, but also what types of jobs. And that really become, that really drives the type of land development. Um, we've organized both the current EOA and, and thinking about this EOA update into uh, sort of four pieces, if you will. The, the first one that, that we'll get into tonight is, is recent development trends and market factors. Looking back um, over the last 20 years to see how we're growing how that um, growth has changed, what are those trends? Um, we do face the challenge of the, the great disruption that, uh, that uh, the pandemic has presented us. Um, we're looking at a lot of data, as you'll see tonight, that was sort of pre-pandemic. Um, and we can talk a little bit about what we think are, we're beginning to see as um, sort of how the pandemic may have changed those trends. Um, the next piece that, that we'll be working on is a, uh, is looking at those employment growth forecasts, um, and also updating our buildable land inventory, um, to determine what development capacity we have, um, to grow future jobs. So this is a very much a supply and demand analysis. Um, and that's where at least initially we'll begin to look at you know, where do we have a lot of surpluses and where do we have shortfalls and how do those fit with the economic vision and the goals um, that we have. And then the fourth step really is um, sort of determining the policy choices, the strategies, the programs, the map changes we need to realize that, ac um, that um, economic vision um, and to really sort of reconcile the shortfall, especially the shortfalls, um, to either turn the shortfalls into surpluses, either through um, new supply or increasing supply, or um, by shifting demand, by considering going in a different direction in terms of the, the types of jobs that were growing in Portland. Uh, you know, in, in certain ways, this is a, a number crunching exercise. This is the, the summary table from the, the 2016 EOA that was done as part of the comprehensive plan update, the 2035 comprehensive plan update, where, as you see in these first two columns, we, we sort of broke down the demand um, 
in terms of, of added jobs uh, by large sectors, central city office, industrial, neighborhood commercial retail services, campus institutions like hospitals and colleges. Um, we sort of translate those jobs into a land demand, depending on the density and the zoning. You can see, you know, in Central City where we have multi-story office buildings, we can, we can um, accommodate a lot of jobs in a small footprint. Whereas in, in the industrial area, um, where we have um, really one-story buildings and lots of um, lay-down area and outdoor storage and truck maneuvering area, the job density is, is really lower and almost 10 times lower. Um, and that we'll go through that exercise again um, through this. And at the same time, the supply side, the buildable land inventory says what we have available um, with our zoning map, with recent development patterns um, to really, and, and then this last, these last two columns are really about that reconciliation. And what you see here with these two columns and what the takeaway is, is that, um, you know, where we wound up in 2016 is um, with a lot of capacity in the central city, a lot of ability to go up, um, that resulted in more than two times the expected um, demand uh, for growth um, by, the, by the year 2035. The opposite is true in um, the industrial areas. And, and we had to work really hard um, to figure out uh, you know, how we could um, accommodate this projected growth. And we wound up with a very small surplus of 111 acres, which, which barely meets that um, future demand. Uh, and then in, in the neighborhood commercial, again, we have lots of capacity um, in our current zoning map um, to accommodate future growth in our neighborhood commercial area. And we have, um, and then with campus ins institutions, as part of the comp plan, we did some changes there. We created a whole new um, comp plan map designation and zoning category um, that really, uh, you know, generated a lot of capacity and room to grow on those campuses. Um, so that the takeaway from all of this is a lot of the discussion for the EOA, you'll see as we get into this, quickly comes back to um, the industrial areas, because that's where we have the tightest land supply and um, the most land extensive uses and a lot of competing policy objectives, especially in terms of natural resource connect, uh, natural resource protections, because of where our industrial areas are located along the Willamette and Columbia rivers and along the Columbia Slough. And so that really this EOA discussion keeps us circling back to what is going on in the industrial areas. How do we use that, those areas going forward? Uh, yeah, Eli. Uh, yeah, quick question on the industrial lands. Do we, does Portland need to meet its goal nine objectives, industrial lands in the city level or is there a regional calculation that's done? I guess I'm trying to figure out Obviously, there's industrial lands all around the city of Portland and inside it. How do those relate from a regulatory perspective? Um, from, from a regulatory state perspective, under goal nine, you know, we have um, the opportunity to um, set our economic vision. And so just because we may have grown a certain way in the past doesn't mean we have to grow that way in the future. Um, and, and that particularly comes um, up in um, Portland um, as, as, and as Steve will show you, you know, we've had a lot of growth in our industrial area over the last um, eight years uh, in, in this last business cycle. Um, the supply is getting tighter. Um, at the same time, you know, one of the key questions that really is the transition here um, to the project goals is, and it's back to that um, 
you know, what, what does shared inclusive prosperity mean, um, both for the city of Portland? Um, and, and as the question you're raising is, how do we set that in the context of a regional economy, a regional job market, right? Because not everybody who lives in Portland works in Portland. It's about 60%. And not everybody who works in Portland lives in Portland. Again, it's about 60%. So, you know, how much of that, um, you know, industrial growth can shift to other locations in the region or even outside of the region, just depending on what it is and what it wants. Um, you know, it part of that is up to us and part of it and saying like, hey, we only have room for this much and the region um, is going to have to um, look at accommodating that. There's going to be demand for certain types of land use that we just can't accommodate in Portland. But it also raises a question of what that means in terms of this um, inclusive prosperity or shared economic prosperity about what it means about, you know, especially for Portlanders without college degrees, where are they, you know, are we willing to accept, you know, what can we do to create opportunity in Portland versus having to commute outside of Portland to find that equivalent um, middle wage job that Steve will start to, to get into. Um, and that and that really is sort of one of the driving questions we have here. Um, and, and there are opportunities other than for middle wage jobs for people without college degrees other than the industrial area. But as you'll see as Steve gets into his presentation, most of that opportunity are in industrial jobs. And so um, one of the strategies we're going to want to work through on um, this process is to identify what are those opportunities, what are the, what are the alternatives, and what are the programs that are needed to support you know realizing both industrial jobs and other middle wage sector jobs um, to create that opportunity within Portland. Yeah, Jeff. So, so, Tom, in thinking about it, you, you made the point, and I was not on the commission in 2016. I just joined when you wrapped this up. But I have been involved in EOA analysis with Hillsborough and Metro. And as you said, traditionally, this is a, a number crunching exercise to a large extent. You sort of analyze supply, demand, surplus, what you know, and, and you, you kind of get a number. And that's driven by goal nine and state laws, the city has to do that. But, you, you, it, but you're throwing something entirely, uh, to me, new into the mix. And I'm wondering if this was done last time or if this is new, where you're, you're really bringing some broad policy considerations to bear. I mean, you're sort of saying the numbers only is a starting point. We, we could crunch the numbers, get to a conclusion that, oh, we've got to come up with you know 200 more industrial acres. But if I'm understanding what you're saying, but at that point, we're not just going to do uh, necessarily, how do we come up with 200 more acres? We're going to say, do we want 200 acres? Why do we want them? What, I mean, so, so we're going to sort of imbue what used to be a number crunching exercise with far more sort of policy goals. Correct. Is that sort of where this is heading? Correct. And I think that's, that's for, for two reasons. Um, one is, you know, and we've had these discussions with DLCD um, that that puts that that emphasis on that first step, that economic vision, and looking at all of the policies, not just the Chapter Six policies in the Comp Plan, and how do we balance those policies and those objectives um, across sort of all the chapters of the Comp Plan, and not just Chapter Six. Um, the second is, you know, recognizing that, you know, essentially Portland is a landlocked city and goal nine has this iner inherent assumption that basically applies to cities even outside the metro region or the, or the rest of the state, which always assumes that you have a relief valve by expanding the UGB to accommodate that future growth. And we just don't have that option available to us. Um, and so that's either back to Eli's point, which is sort of shift some of that demand elsewhere in the region, or, you know, and unfortunately, you know, we haven't seen a lot of cases of industrial development going up 
Um, you know, there's only so much intensification that we can sort of squeeze out of our, our existing industrial land base. Um, and so I think it is, it is more, you are correct in, in 2016, as part of the last comp plan update, we sort of just ran the numbers out and tried to figure out how to meet that number. Um, and this time around, um, we are doing a broader policy, um, uh, as, as Steve will refer to this multi-objective policy process that's part of that consideration um, in terms of, of the type of jobs that we're looking to accommodate over the next 25 years or so. And one quick question, Metro DLCD, are they supportive? Do they see a legal path to do that? Are they nervous or what, how would you characterize your discussions with the, the regulators? I would characterize it as um, DLCD was supportive and said, yes, you can go ahead and do that. Um, again, pointing to the economic vision part of the goal nine rules. I would say uh, Metro is um, agnostic. Um, they don't, they like to say they don't do goal nine. They look at the region as a whole and how many jobs can you accommodate? And they, they think Portland, you got to figure out how to accommodate 82,000 jobs. Well, we're going to accommodate 82,000 jobs, whether they're office jobs or industrial jobs or retail jobs. It's kind of up to us. In, in terms of Metro's perspective. And when, when is the city obligated to adopt its EOA? We are not obligated. It, we don't have the same set of rules like are now applied to the housing needs analysis. However, as you will see, as we get into these concepts and scenarios, um, we need to adopt a new EOA to support our decisions around um, floodplain regulations and um, E zones along the Columbia Slough, and a number of other um, sort of natural resource protection measures and climate resiliency measures that have come up recently. Um, and so that's really what's driving this process. Thanks. Yeah. Oriana? Yeah, I know this is a very high level analysis, but one of the things I'm chewing on actually gets a little bit at kind of what Metro is kicking to the city in terms of like, what are the jobs? Because I think, especially from an equity perspective, there are jobs that have significant mental and physical health impacts, jobs that are related to industries that have community impacts. And I don't want to suggest that industrial jobs are not good jobs. But how are you weighing like the quality of what is is potentially being created here? Is that a future layer of analysis or how does that come into play in terms of how we weigh some of the decisions around what industries get attracted, what industries get attracted to what kinds of communities, how that interacts with climate impacts or some of the other goals that not only exist at the city level, but in the other land use goals for the state. So help me unpack how you're trying to untangle kind of the mess I just put in front of you. Yeah, it, if you could just hold that thought and we'll come back to it at the end. And that's really one of the focus of the this early community discussion is how we unpack that because that is at the, the crux of the issue and, and how we achieve, again, those multiple objectives. Um, so we got into this a little bit, you know, as part of the comp plan, we uh, set a goal uh, um, to do an update every five to seven years, which is about how often we get a new regional forecast allocated down to the city level. Um, we've, we've had another sort of business cycle um, that, you know, a constantly changing economy and trends, both nationally, regionally, and, and what it means for Portland. As I just touched on, we have a, you know, the, the EOA and the, and the whole framework. When we want to make decisions for other policy objectives, we have to look at what the impact is on, um, on the, the economic opportunity and our land supply is so tight in the industrial areas that it requires careful analysis and updated analysis to, do, to make those decisions. And you know, back to this concept of shared prosperity um, in which Steve will get into here in a minute to, to show just 
um, I guess, how short we are in terms of creating these, these middle wage job opportunities. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve and he's gonna run through um, some of these uh, recent market trend research that he's been doing that helps set the context for many of these um, policy questions that, that we need to sort through. Uh, thanks, Tom. Good evening, I'm Steve Kuntz. I'm a senior economic planner at BPS. Um, I thought I might ask for a time check right now. Are we going to um, seven o'clock? I, I have about right. 20 minutes of slides and then we have process slides and then we were hoping to open it up to uh, discussion by the commission. My agenda says 7.45. Oh, okay, we've got plenty of time. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, um, the forecast that um, Tom mentioned um, uh, as part of our process needs to be based on a trends analysis of growth and market opportunities, which we will be publishing in the coming days. You got a copy of the executive summary. I'd like to go over some of the issues that we found in those trends in the next few slides. Um, a first conclusion shown here that is that uh, the city and region have had strong job growth. Um, this chart compares national and local trends of average annual job growth in the last three business cycles. Um, one takeaway here from the chart is that the region um, shown by the orange bars is growing about uh, 50 to 60% faster than the nation in the blue bars in each of the last three business cycles. Um, so we're in a growing region. The second takeaway is that the national job sprawl trends of recent decades in which cities were growing uh, or that uh, suburbs were growing much faster than core cities appears to be leveling out. Portland had about 71,000 new jobs in the last business cycle, growing as a little bit faster than the region and faster than what was forecast in the EOA update. Um, Tom, we can go to the next slide. Um, State Planning Goal 9 and the EOA look at job, job growth trends and opportunities in terms of land use type. And so we looked at land use uh, or job growth sector trends um, that correspond to the business district types in Portland, generally shown on this map and this pie chart. Um, the blue um, uh, the blue jobs are office sector jobs, which are primarily located in the upper floors of the central city. Um, uh, industrial sector jobs, manufacturing and distribution are primarily in the gray areas in the uh, Harbor and Columbia corridor industrial districts. Retail and consumer service jobs are mainly concentrated in neighborhood commercial corridors and centers. Uh, and you can't see it as well, but there are 15 large colleges and hospitals that are uh, institutional jobs. These um, four sector types each um, represent about a fourth of city jobs and about a fourth of the regional jobs. So the takeaway here is that the growing economy has diverse land needs. Um, the job growth opportunities of the last um, of these four um, sector groups are largely regional. And the region we've uh, uh, done the analysis uh, looking at uh, the seven county uh, MSA, which is the, the commute shed of the regional labor market. Um, this chart tracks um, uh, regional job growth trends over the last three business cycles in each of these three sector types. Um, the main takeaway is that each of these areas are growing um, generally uh, in the last business cycle, they varied from one to 2% per year with the fastest growth in healthcare and education. Um, comparing economic swings or downswings, um, the industrial sectors had the largest downswings in the two previous um, uh, recessions and consumer services and healthcare and education have been, had bigger downswings in the current recession. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in, the, in the next slide. So let's switch to that. Um, while the EOA focuses on long-term growth capacity, we will also plan for adequate short-term land supply up to 2030, um, which supports continuing recovery from the COVID recession. Um, this chart compares regional job losses in those four sector groups in a little bit more detail in the last um, four recessions. Um, I can, uh, I can 
come back to this later because there's a lot of detail here if people have questions. But the main takeaway is that major job losses in the COVID recession are much different than in the relatively um, uh, uh, consistent pattern of, of the previous recessions in that uh, the predominant job losses have been con in consumer services and to a less extent, healthcare and education, which were relatively stable in the previous recessions. And um, and the, uh, the larger job losses in, in production or manufacturing and construction um, uh, were relatively moderate in this recession. And, and the faster, fastest recovery in the current recession has been um, in the uh, trade and transportation sector. Katie, you had a question, should? Yeah, just a quickie. Um, I, I, you're using different words in each of these um, slides, it seems like. Like there's industrial lands, and does that does that line up with production or trade and transport or you know I mean um, that's I, that's I mean, kind of a question I have. Uh, yeah, it, industrial is difficult because industrial industries are in, in uh, uh, job analysis are a portion of the sector. Um, we're looking at industry from a land use perspective know. here is the types of businesses that locate in industrial districts which I generally call production and distribution. Um, production is manufacturing and construction, and to some extent utilities. Distribution is, is transportation and wholesale trade. Those are the big sectors. Okay, so maybe I misunderstood. So these, um, these four lines going through here for each of the different um, time periods are all, um, would be using industrial lands? No, they're all different sectors of the economy. The industrial uh, sectors are generally the dark gray and the orange. Okay, okay. The dark gray, I separated them because they have much different job trends in the recessions. The dark gray, we've had big construct losses, job losses during recessions in construction and manufacturing in the previous recessions, not very much in this recession. And then the, the fastest recovery in this recession has been in trade and transportation, which corresponds to most of our industrial land demand. Okay, thanks. And so in other words, I need to stay nimble and pay attention to the way the different things shift around. I'll try to, thanks. Jesse, you had a question? Should... Yeah, I've got a quick question. So production, transportation, and trade office, all of those groupings, um, is that just like the national standard for those various types of groupings? Has Are those Portland specific? Are those like the most popular here? How are those grouped? No, those are uh, fairly Oregon specific in our, our, our goal nine requirements. It requires us to look at job growth trends and, and economic trends in terms of land use types. So different types of employment land. So we're looking at, and um, so in a couple of slides ago, I went through the, the different uh, business district types, and those are the types of districts that are jobs that locate in those. And actually the next slide will help you see that, I think a little more clearly. Um, yeah, okay, I'll um, go on to here. Um, job growth by sector is somewhat different than than job growth by business district. Um, and this chart shows uh, from a squint test how they are interrelated. Um, office sector jobs represent uh, the first three bars on this graph on the left-hand side. Um, office sector jobs are mainly concentrated in the central city. Um, so the blue portion is the largest and it's growing the fastest. Um, the uh, next three bars are the industrial sector jobs, and they are they are also growing in these years. They are concentrated in the industrial districts, and they are are growing in the industrial districts and shrinking in other districts in the city. Um, the other uh, two land use types uh, sector types are more mixed. Education and healthcare are particularly concentrated in the campus institutions, but they're also located in the other geographies. And the retail and service jobs are particularly concentrated in the neighboring commercial areas, but they're also concentrated in the other um, geographies in the city. Um, so um, I hope that answers the question. I, um, I can come back to it if, if there uh, is uh, further confusion. 
Um, I'll go into uh, development types. Katie, do you have your hand up still or are you, um, uh, that's been addressed, okay. So um, no. <laughs> the, the re real estate development trends have been somewhat different um, than job trends in the last business cycle in that occupied industrial space has grown slightly faster than, than office and retail space. Um, uh, this chart compares growth in occupied space by, by building type and geography in the last business cycle. Uh, one takeaway here is that multifamily housing um, really dominated development trends overall and in the commercial districts, uh, reflecting the higher de uh, building density in multifamily housing. A second takeaway here is that um, Portland shift to higher density building types through redevelopment is meeting employment land demand unevenly. Um, one example of that is that uh, industrial buildings grew uh, in Portland's industrial districts um, at a pace uh, that is or at pace with the region, adding about 7 million square feet. Um, but Portland lost 2 million square feet in the commercial districts, mainly in the central city, um, in the last business cycle as well, um, through displacement um, through higher density land uses. And a second example um, shown here in the central city is that it is the, uh, the central business district of the region, but we lost occupied employment space in the region or in the, in the central city in the last business cycle um, in that um, along with a sizable um, uh, growth in multifamily housing, 8 million square feet, again, um, growing through redevelopment. Um, I'll switch to the next slide. Uh, uh, Tom briefly mentioned the, the, uh, um, the prosperity goals for uh, economic development that were set in the Portland plan and the comp plan um, around uh, a, a growing diverse economy and uh, a competitive traded sector growth and, and economic equity. Uh, Portland is meeting our prosperity goals uh, that Tom mentioned on uh, uh, diverse job growth and generally traded sector uh, growth, but we're backsliding on economic equity trends. And so we've uh, tried to focus on that more in, in this analysis to try to uh, delve into those goals and, and look at the trends. We're particularly... Um, uh, backsliding on uh, uh, growing income inequality, persistent racial income disparities, and uh, declining affordability, which results in a, a growing share of poorer households. And I'll talk a little bit about each, each of those. Um, increasing income inequality, which is the uh, focus of this um, chart, is, uh, is a national trend, but it is occurring uh, faster in this region. It's driven by our more wage polarized job growth. Um, these charts compare regional jobs in blue um, with national um, uh, uh, jobs in gray of the high, middle, and low wage occupations. And here, Katie, I'm switching from sectors, which are business types, to occupations, which are job types. Um, they correlate, but they're not quite the same. Um, the top, top chart shows the region's shrinking share of middle wage jobs. Um, from 58% uh, in 2000 to 48% in 2018. Um, this is occurring about twice as fast as the, as the, uh, the national change. The bottom chart shows the mix of new jobs that are creating this trend. Our job growth has been um, concentrated essentially at the, the top and bottom fourths of the wage distribution. Um, the takeaway here is that our job growth trends are growing uh, population, the community of of uh, high income and low income jobs, um, haves and have nots around a, a shrinking middle relative to previous generations. And then one last point I wanna uh, uh, take away on this is that uh, notice our J-shaped distribution of new jobs in this region, um, uh, more high income oriented, high wage oriented compared to the more U-shaped trend um, nationally. And I'll take that to the, the next slide. Um, we're, we're showing the same um, J-shaped trend in our housing growth that's related to how the economy grows. This is a slide that shows 
the region's net new households in the last uh, business cycle as well. Um, they're strongly concentrated in high income households. More than 85% of the new households uh, had an annual income more than 100,000 a year and over half had more than 150,000 a year. Um, so uh, housing growth trends is interrelated with job growth trends. Um, I'll switch to the next slide, Tom. A second um, burdens and benefits trend of uh, wage polarized job growth is our persistent racial income disparities. Um, shown in this chart, um, this chart compares the region's median household income disparities by race in 2010 and 2019. Um, the region's median income in black households is only about roughly half that, a little more than half of white households. Uh, and most other racial groups are in between. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about what drives those trends in a minute. Um, a second, Tom, if you can switch to the next slide. Um, declining income self-sufficiency is the third major trend uh, that is making the local economy less equitable. Uh, the main takeaway here is that um, uh, the share of households um, that Multnomah County's um, share of households with inadequate in income to meet their basic needs uh, increased from 23% in 2008 to 34% in 2017. This was the metric set in the Portland plan for inclu uh, inclusive household prosperity is to increase self uh, income self-sufficiency, but um, it is going um, the other way substantially. Uh, this metric is tracked by the Income Self-Sufficiency Index, which uh, tracks county-level prices of basic needs for um, uh, uh, multiple, um, multiple basic needs by family size, um, such as housing, childcare, et cetera. What's driving this, tre this trend is that rising prices are outpacing uh, working class wages. This chart shows uh, um, that declining power, uh, buying power of low-wage occupations and middle-wage occupations compared to prices. Um, and it's essentially uh, a trend in the last um, business cycle with the growth, um, the, the buying power of uh, working class wages are substantially going down. Um, declining affordability is typically uh, explained in terms of housing trends in our tighter housing market, but it also has to do with affordability and in a relationship with wages. Uh, and again, from our previous slide, our concentrated local growth of high wage jobs and high income households has market impact of bidding up local prices and putting upward pressure on um, the cost of living. Tom, I'll switch to the next slide. Um, so explaining these trends, the next couple of slides explain in a little bit more detail by what I mean by middle wage jobs and occupation types and, and uh, uh, racial income disparities. Um, the previous charts on wage inequality are based on occupation groups, which again are job types um, that are shown here. Um, each of these uh, circles are occupations. The size are the number of jobs in those occupations in the region. Um, the green jobs are high wage occupations. Um, uh, orange are middle wage, um, yellow, low wage. Uh, middle wage is generally are those with a median income between 35,000 a year and 60,000 in 2018. It's, it's up to about 37,000 to uh, about 60,000 in, in 2020. Katie, you have another question? I just wanted to thank you for this particular graph or whatever you call it, graphic. It's just uh, really wonderful. I mean, I spent a lot of time looking at it. And I did want to ask though, is it really true that there's like an actual gap or is that just an um, artifact of putting together the... Um, so the I should have shown it. Yeah, I should have drawn two circles here about the, the wage distribution of jobs. I said it, it's, it's bifurcated economy um, in, in our wage distribution, meaning that it, it acts like two separate labor markets. The high income jobs tend to require um, bachelor's degrees or higher, more advanced. So it education. really is almost like two different, completely different... Um, setups there there's got to be interaction but um it's just very interesting thank you uh, uh, yes. I'll, I'll let you keep going <laughs> there is I'll, I'll explain this graph in a little more detail um the 
The chart shows um, uh, regional jobs in 2018 by major occupation types. The, the vertical axis is the median income. Um, the horizontal axis is the uh, four-year college attainment of workers in those occupations. And again, the middle wage occupations are generally between 35,000 and 60,000 at the median, the midpoint of those occupations. Um, so as Katie pointed out, there's a pattern of a bifurcated wage distribution here. Uh, for workers with bachelor's degrees, um, uh, higher income jobs are generally available, but only about 44% of regions workers and about 36% of BIPOC workers have bachelor's degrees. And most jobs don't require bachelor's degrees. Um, but for workers without bachelor's degrees, middle wage jobs are important as a source of higher pay and upward mobility for a uh, little more than half of the workforce. Um, when you look at, um, at the, the mix of jobs um, within those middle wage jobs held by people without bachelor's degrees, most of, or a little more than half um, are in the industrial occupations. Uh, and it depends on which recent year you look at. There were some redefinitions. It's about 60% in, in 2020. Um, a little more than a fourth are in office support occupations and the rest are in a mix of other occupations. Healthcare support is another big one around as uh, nine to 10%. Tom, I'll go to the, the next slide. Um, so the previous slide showed median income um, in, in terms of looking at higher pay for occupations for people that don't have bachelor's degrees or higher. Um, upward mobility is probably a bigger wage impact. Um, this chart shows um, the wage distribution or the distribution of jobs by, by um, quartile wages uh, of this, the occupations that um, typically don't require a college degree. So um, most middle wage jobs are in that, um, that circled area um, with a, a, a range in the 75 percentile of uh, um, between 45,000 a year and 53,000 a year. Um, and that 45th percentile is essentially the, the starting pay of the, the highest paid fourth. And the idea is people, um, there's upward mobility within those occupations. There's much less upward mobility within the, the lower wage occupations. Um, as an aside here too, um, the region's warehouse and distribution sector jobs are often or sometimes mistakenly characterized as low paying jobs. They are right in this uh, 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 um, pattern for middle wage jobs. Um, the um, the uh, transportation is in, um, let's see, 53, 40, about 48,000 a year is that uh, 75 percentile wage for the transportation and warehouse occupation. Tom, I'll go to the um, next slide. Racial uh, equity issues have really been a, a, a driving um, a, a focus of our, our um, equity analysis. And so we tried to look at what types of job growth will, um, will reduce BIPOC income disparities and will essentially raise BIPOC incomes. Um, this chart, which is based on the region's distribution of jobs by, by sector, race, education, and, and uh, wage, um, it shows that it's mainly industrial and to a lesser extent office sector jobs that raise black and BIPOC incomes relative to the rest of the economy. Uh, industrial jobs uh, raise BIPOC incomes by about 20% and uh, black incomes by 25% relative to combined other occupation or other sectors. Uh, and off the sector jobs raise BIPOC incomes by 16% 16, 16 relative to the rest of the economy. In contrast, Brianne, I'll come to you in just a second. Let me finish this couple of sentences explaining it. Um, job growth in the retail and consumer services sectors actually reduced by BIPOC incomes relative to the rest of the economy by 28%. And jobs in the healthcare and education um, sectors reduced BIPOC incomes by 8% relative to the rest of the economy. So the takeaway here is that the faster job growth that's occurring in Portland in healthcare and education and in uh, retail, well, 
not really retail, but consumer services such as food service um, are, are increasing our uh, BIPOC wage disparities. Oriana, you had a question? Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt here, um, but this this slide is really making me wonder uh, a couple of things. One is because this is compared to the rest of the economy, how do wages for Black, Indigenous, um, and other communities of color compare to like white wages in these particular sectors? Because I wonder, does production and distribution have a bigger impact because Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color are more likely to be hired into those industries? or more likely to be paid parity. Like it feels like there's a different level of analysis here that I would like to understand, which is where right. is there racism in hiring or where is there racism in wages in the, in the industries? I, that, I know that's not what this is necessarily about, but I do wanna ask that question. It is, well, it's not exact. I, I don't know if it answers your question, but that's actually the perfect um, segue to the next slide, which tries to drill down at it a little bit more. Um, but to get to your previous question, um, the the wages in the warehouse and distribution or transportation and, and um, transportation and warehousing sector are equivalent to the other industrial sectors. So um, the, this next slide shows um, the uh, methodology of the previous slide. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this and I can come back to it if you want to, but it is based on the distribution of jobs by wage and race and educational attainment. So here I'm just showing um, the, the combined BIPOC workers in the region and it compares the jobs in the industrial sectors, which I'm calling production and distribution with all the other sectors in the economy. And it looks at the wage distribution and essentially the, the uh, more pink area that shows uh, more wages or more jobs to the right mean more jobs are paying a higher, uh, higher wage than the other combined sectors. We did this for the other four sector groups and there are graphs like this for each of, the, um, each of those sector groups in the trends report, as well as for each race. This just shows combined BIPOC, but I show, um, have them uh, broken out for each race. So, um, the, the previous slide was based on this side. So it looks at the conditions in 2018. These are the wages that these jobs are, are providing by race and by education level. Oh, one other thing in this, um, before you go off of this, Tom, um, that for most, most of the sectors, the real advantage of, of, uh, of middle wage jobs is in people that don't have um, bachelor's degrees. But in this case, um, uh, uh, industrial sector jobs also ra substantially raise incomes of people with bachelor's degrees. Um, so it's uh, uh, less, uh, um, uh, they're more widely accessible jobs. Um, so I could put, there are a lot more, uh, 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 equity trend uh, uh, graphs that I could go through to explain these, but I want to jump ahead to land use and policy choices have big implications on these uh, income inequality trends, um, coming back to the choices in the EOA. Uh, one way this happens is depicted in the upper chart, which shows the distribution of jobs in specific business districts by regional wage quartiles. Um, so if, if those uh, bar charts or those bars on the top were the same as the region, regional wa wage quartiles, they would be a straight line. Um, when you look at the mixed use centers and corridors, um, the dense areas of, of the city where we have concentrated job growth, they have a wage polarized uh, distribution of jobs. The more we grow in those areas, we'll grow a wage polarized distribution of jobs. Um, in contrast, the industrial area and what is general employment zones, which are more back office or business park oriented zones, they tend to have more middle wage jobs in, in comparison. They are also at a somewhat lower density. Um, so uh, uh, that's one way this happens. A second way, looking at the lower graph, 
um, is that uh, the, the wage polarized jobs have more room to grow in Portland uh, based on the comp plan. Um, the second graph shows, the lower graph shows the, um, the demand and supply that Tom talked about earlier of jobs in different business district types arranged by wages. Um, and we provide more capacity for retail and commercial growth um, than a demand. Demand is the, the blue, uh, dark blue outline and supply is the, the light blue area. So we have a lot more supply than we have demand for low wage jobs and for high wage jobs. And we have a fairly tight capacity for middle wage jobs, particularly in the industrial areas, but for also the, the general employment areas. The takeaway here is that, uh, is that our inequitable job growth trends are substantially a product of our policies uh, and the policy trade-offs of, of, of adding industrial growth capacity uh, will continue to be controversial challenge in the current EOA update as they were a challenge in the previous EOA update. Um, the trends to date show a more constrained industrial land supply. Um, they were constrained previously and they are more constrained now. So in response, we propose to analyze a range of demand and supply scenarios um, by their multi-objective policy trade-offs, both for uh, growing prosperity and for growing or uh, meeting other city goals. And Rachel will, and Tom will explain uh, what we mean by that in terms of, of process. So we'll go into that more and we'll ask you about it. I wanted to provide one other quick though preview slide of, of, um, of the forecast. Um, the purpose again of the trends analysis is to inform the forecast. Um, this is a, a preliminary, um, uh, uh, preliminary look at it. Um, the job growth trends are shown in black. Um, uh, the last, well, from 2000 to 2019. Um, the current EOA forecast is shown in green, um, growing at about 1.3% a year. Metro's current forecast is shown in, in orange, adding about 100,000 jobs by 2045. Um, and uh, I show that going to current um, uh, 2020, but um, Metro isn't showing um, those those numbers. So it, the, the the forecast bends down there between 2030 and 2019. And then if we look at the last business cycle trend, um, the the recent growth trend in Portland has been substantially faster, uh, and we would. Uh, uh, following that trend, we would grow about 170,000 jobs by 2045 if we look that direction. So we can look at, at scenario options for how much to grow through, through this process and again, take that out to community conversation. And with that, I'll stop. Oh, well, the next slide is on trend takeaways. I can um, go over that briefly. Um, and this is in the... Um, this is in the report. Portland has experienced robust job growth. Generally, the region and the city are growing about 50 to more than 60% faster than the, the nation in the last business cycle. Um, growth has been unequal um, in terms of uh, income distribution. Most of the job growth, uh, about 56%, has been in high wage occupations. Um, BIPOC workers have um, have higher incomes in the industrial and to a less extent office sector jobs, but most of the job growth has been had the opposite effect of tending to reduce BIPOC incomes. Uh, most about, if we look at the middle wage jobs held by people that don't have bachelor's degrees, about 60% of them in 2020 um, are in the industrial sector. Uh, and our industrial land supply is tight now and it's getting tighter. Um, the, the harbor and airport districts, our biggest uh, uh, district is at 100% capacity. We have no surplus to 2035 at this time. And we've had a lot of job growth since 2010. So with that, uh, I'll stop. And um, I think Tom, you asked about questions so we can start into that. Jesse, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question from an economic perspective. So when we're looking at trying to zone more land for industrial use, does that just, are we making the assumption that more jobs will come with that? Is that just part of the economic analysis or can you flesh that out a little bit for me? 
Yeah, so in the, the real estate development trends slide that I had earlier, I said it's meeting employment land demand unevenly. It's growing, growing through higher density through redevelopment, um, particularly favors higher density residential development. Um, but employment development has been lagging. We're seeing a lot of displacement in the industrial um, uh, building space in the central city and the others. And actually, when we look at, at, at office space, the biggest share of, of office demand in the region, um, 45%, something like that, is for class B and C office space um, that is um, low rise, which means less than seven floors. Um, but uh, the central city is losing space in that, in that um, sector type. So growing through redevelopment at higher densities is, uh, is not meeting those, uh, meeting that demand. And so uh, much of the um, meeting those land needs will require vacant land or will require uh, less expensive redevelopment sites. I guess I may be still a little confused. So looking at like industrial land specifically, I guess what I'm thinking about is if we're trying to increase the amount of industrial land that we have, and maybe I'm just not understanding what you're saying, but is that just, we're making the assumption that that will bring more jobs from the production and manufacturing side that we're looking at? Like, I just want to make sure there's a tight correlation between those two. It will accommodate demand. Our current, for, our current supply will not accommodate demand in 2045. Is what I'm saying. So, um, uh, I think, we'll be look yeah, the answer is yes. Yes. Right? That, it, that if we have more industrial land, that will enable more um, industrial jobs in Portland. Um, and some of that gets back to the other questions that were asked earlier, which is, is if we're not able to accommodate that within Portland, then that demand will go elsewhere in the region or outside of the region. I think, Jeff, you had a question. It looks like you're up next in the queue. Thank you. A lot to digest there. Um, I was intrigued by this notion, and I, I read it as well in your executive summary that our core land use policies, it's your term, are contributing to this wage disparity between the, the racial wage disparity. And as I understand what you're telling us, the core policy is that our, our emphasis, and this has been a, a core policy for 20 years or more, is, is that we wanna grow in our centers and corridors. And you're saying the kind of jobs that we find in our centers and corridors, are not what you're describing as the middle wage, decent paying job for someone with lower education levels. And I, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around that. So are you, are you saying that was a consequence of the, the, the zoning land use policies? We wanted growth in corridors and centers and therefore we created more wage Disparity. I, I, I'm just. I'm trying to pull it all yeah. together because it, it doesn't seem intuitively logical to me. Are you saying if we had only put more industrial zoning around our centers and corridors, we would not have a racial wage disparity? I mean, I, I, I'm having a hard time connecting the dots on what yeah. we what so, we should do differently with our core land use policies. Um, I, you will have more information with the rest of the. Um, the uh, trends report where I couldn't cover much in the executive summary, uh, and it's already a bit too long. I looked at um, at trends um, by uh, wage distribution in the 100 largest regions around the country and compared trends of uh, middle wage job growth and high wage job growth. Most of the growing regions, well, we have a fairly flat national trend in middle wage jobs, but that's related to um, relatively moderate to aggressive middle wage job growth in the more growing regions and and uh, and declining middle wage jobs 
in, in uh, slower growing and shrinking regions. But the growing regions like Portland are growing a lot more middle wage jobs. Uh, and they're growing jobs in particular occupations, particularly um, uh, uh, administrative support in back office type of, of, of developments and in, in uh, transportation sector in, in more warehouse and distribution occupations. And that's really been the dominant occupation types for middle wage job growth. Um, so there is that opportunity um, uh, to, to meet demand and create more um, equitable outcomes. There are lots of policy advantages of compact development as well, saving par farmland, um, uh, 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 vital uh, centers and corridors, uh, um, uh, a lot of it, uh, sustainability advantages around compact development. Um, we don't talk about it as much, or we haven't in the past, but wage polarized job growth is a disadvantage from it when you look at economic equity trends. Did that get at your question, Jeff? Uh, I'm, I'm Jeff I, I struggled with that, trying to figure that out and and parse that as well. Um, but I but I think when you think about our centers and corridors grow a lot of office jobs and a lot of retail jobs, and that's the wage polarization that Steve is talking about. Uh, why don't we go to Oriana? Oh, I think I was not next. I think Eli and Erica were before me. Okay. And I've also asked a, a couple of questions, so happy to defer to folks who have hands up who have not asked yet. Okay, I'll try with my, can you hear me? Someone nod? Yeah. Okay, I'm trying a new device here. Um, thanks for the presentation and I'm acknowledging my own bias and maybe PSE's bias is that um, I think we tend to have bachelor's degrees and not work in industrial areas. Um, so I appreciate the perspective you're sharing on that. It's feeling like, um, I'm trying to understand, make sure I understand the policy um, ask of the PSE on this. And it seems like we're balancing two um, goals. We got the income wage disparity, which um, gets worse when we have less industrial areas to work with. And we also have several projects that have not come before us because they would impact development options in industrial areas and thinking about tree protections, um, natural resource protections like wetlands and, um, and also the CEI hub where we've got fossil fuel industry. Um, and we've not been able to um, adopt plans to, um, well, it's our ability to regulate those areas has been constrained by the need to have jobs in those areas. Um, so I guess I'm, my question is, am I getting this right? Are these the things we're balancing? Is it really a zero sum game like it seems like? Um, and then the last question is, um, Am I correct in this assessment that it's just, is there a mapping component to this project where we potentially would, would limit the actual extent of the industrial areas? Or is it more, if we don't need as many jobs, then it's possible to lay regulations on top of those areas without violating goal nine? Um, it might be good to postpone that question, but we're gonna be talking about the process that gets to it, but. I think we have to get into it. I, I, and I think if I understand your question correctly, I think when one of the questions we will get have to look at and get to is that as as we have a you know a constrained supply of industrial land, and we have these other alternatives, you know what what are our other options to um, our limited options to increase that supply sort of put the emphasis and the EOA is a, a is a way to make a, a a stronger policy statement about the need for things like brownfield programs and figuring out super fun um, and so there's a policy message to be sent there um, that we sort of made in the last EOA and we can make it again that there's a lot of opportunity for brownfield cleanup and for resolving superfund liability so that cleanup gets going that can unlock capacity in our industrial areas but then the other question is well what other programs and what other um changes can we make probably not a lot in terms of the zoning code but some opportunities to accommodate those middle wage uh, um, types like we're talking about like 
you know, how can we build more class B and class C office space? You know, where are those opportunities? We did some of that along 82nd Avenue when we, and in Gateway, when we rezoned some mixed use areas back, back to mixed employment areas as part of the, as part of the, the last comp plan changes, you know, so what, what are some of those other things that we can do um, that may, you know, take advantage of those middle wage opportunities that not are not as great as the industrial area, but do offer that opportunity. And so how can we maximize that opportunity elsewhere? Um, and, and that's how we get at that rebalancing um, through this process. Thank um, you. And that, that helps I, understand maybe not a zero sum, but those, those creative ways to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, Eli, Eli um, the, uh, the land supply, the existing land supply is a, a zero sum game in the industrial areas. There are opportunities to expand the industrial land supply or the other proposed projects that you've uh, been reviewing would uh, reduce the existing buildable land inventory. So they would reduce the industrial land supply. Uh, that's in that area. Um, potentially, we can, in the EOA and looking at scenarios, we have opportunities to, Tom said, creative ways to look at different ways of doing those projects where you have more natural resource gains and equity gains and economic gains um, by different types of solutions. Um, All right. Who's next? Um, I believe Erica was next. Hi, uh, that was a lot to take in. I hope I've uh, stayed caught up, um, but I'm still trying to uh, parse the uh, potential differences in BIPOC wage trends across different uses that fall within the industrial category. And there's one use type within that that I have questions about specifically, which is laboratories and research and development. So uh, when you read the list of uses under industrial, it's a lot of stuff that typically we would think like, oh yeah, that's industrial. And then there's labs and research and development. I know a little bit about this because I'm currently working on a couple of lab projects in Portland's central east side. Uh, industrial zoning has a lot of benefits, very attractive to uh, do a lab project in an industrial zoned area. My question is, um, what do you know about the BIPOC wage differences across uses with that one specifically? And then has there been any thought about the um, growth, the anticipated growth of life sciences and you know uh, lab sectors in general? Like you look at lab uh, real estate numbers in Boston and San Francisco and everybody's leaving and coming to new markets. So I can foresee a lot of um, growth in that area. And I'm just curious what you make of that. Um, laboratories are, are an allowed use, as you said, in the industrial zones. They tend to be, in terms of occupations, they would primarily be uh, 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 categorized as scientists, where it's our higher wage job, they tend to be in jobs that require bachelor's degrees or higher. Um, so it's among the mix of jobs in industrial areas that are that. Most of the uh, healthcare uh, related jobs are in, um, in commercial areas or in the campus institutions. Um, and in terms of BIPOC um, uh, disparities, um, I was surprised at how um, how much of a, a, a decline in BIPOC incomes result from the the, um, the healthcare and education jobs, and I think it's mostly in the education sector. Um, and I didn't break it down specifically by healthcare, but maybe there's a way of doing it. Breaking it down just by labs would be very difficult because the the racial data is um, it's. It has um, high error rates for some uh, racial groups, um, and uh, it works for large occupations or groups of occupations. It's really hard to break it down to a, a particular uh, sector or type of occupation. Okay, I, I don't know what, what the answer is, but it seems if there is uh, a, an interest in protecting 
industrial space and the the shape of industrial uh, zone land may begin skewing towards a new type of sector, a new type of use that hasn't previously been that dominant in Portland, which is lab and life sciences, it would be worth exploring what that means for some of our assumptions about um, BIPOC wages. Yeah, I, we can look at it and, and we'll, we'll do that. I think one of the issues, it sort of does it scale, right? Like how much how much lab space would you really have to grow to be the equivalent of some of these manufacturing spaces or, or some of the, the, the warehouse and distribution space to sort of provide an equivalent um, opportunity? And, and I'm not sure that we sort of have enough evidence of that to say, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna see Lots of uh, um, you know, lots of lab space that that we have enough evidence, a, a trend there to say like this is really going to scale up and it's going to replace all of this opportunity over here. And I sort of reflect on and and we can check, but you know, at one point for Prosper Portland, bio the biosciences was a big you know going to be the next big thing, and it's still going to be, it, it, it's, I don't think it's even a targeted cluster anymore in terms of being the next big thing um, for the Portland, for Portland or the Portland region. And so I think we need to see a little bit more evidence that that is a building cluster and sector of growth um, before we count on it accommodating a lot of future growth. Thank you. Um, because we're coming up on the last 10 minutes, I'd love to just pause and um, say I haven't, we haven't heard from Janelle, Valeria, or Gabe. So if any, um, any of you would like to speak, um, please raise your hand so that we can make sure to get you in. Steph, I just Steph, I just, just want to jump in too because there's more of the presentation left. <laughs> oh, <laughs> let's be conscious of that. Oh, yes. I mean, we can we can go quick. For this last bit on just to let you know what's coming but if there are other questions on this content um we're happy to take that as well hey, um jesse or katie do you um or do you feel strongly about uh uh just do you feel strongly about um asking a question now do you want to wait until after my question can wait okay um eli is that a new or an old hand okay great please continue thank you all right magic Lovely. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel here to to just give you a, a more of a where we are where we're at in the process. Yeah. Hi everyone. I'm going to keep my video off. My system is very unstable, so you're even you're you're all going in and out. So if that's happening, Tom, then pause me so that somebody else can help sure. out. Sure. Um, so just as you all are familiar with the legislative process, we're on this far left here. I, we're in red. We are here. We're compiling the discussion draft. Um, if you check out the timeline on the bottom, so we're going to be doing that compiling of the discussion draft and holding many different forms of community engagement um, between now and fall. So there's a there's a lot to do in this time frame. A lot of orientation meetings, focus group meetings, which you'll see in a future slide. Some some ideas. We've also gotten some great ideas from Braided River Campaign, some of our industrial business association folks on others that we should be reaching out with. Um, we've also secured some funding through DLCD for um, to hire somebody to help support some additional work and focus groups with the BIPOC community. So that's um, something that we're working on now to get started. So we, we would then be moving into uh, thinking propose, proposed draft, fall or winter uh, with, with this commission. Um, that would take us through uh, probably spring 2023. Our hope would be we'd be at council next spring, summer of 2023. So this is just a 
blow up bigger picture of where we are with the discussion draft. Um, so that top row is really just to between now and through fall, kind of what staff is working on. And we're in that first box in the first phase. Steve shared a lot of the trends report, which still is to be released. We're doing some final touches on the trends report. We'll be working on the land supply and demand analysis. You saw the table that Tom introduced early in the presentation that we'll be updating. Um, and then one of the last slides we have for you in just a moment is some early ideas for um, conceptual scenarios, which we've right now we've only worked on internally with some um, an internal kind of bureau group that we've worked with. So we'll also be that will change over time as we go through our more focused community engagement to get feedback on and, and building our, how will we evaluate all these scenarios? That was a question that came up earlier, I think. Um, it may have been from or Oriana to like, how are we going to make these decisions? Like there's so many, we have a lot of goals. We've got matching our climate and industry goals and we will need to, through our evaluation framework, uh, hear from through our engagement, many different groups and focus groups and community meetings to determine what's most important to folks to help us figure out how we're going to evaluate um, the, the, the scenarios we come up with. And so then, then if you look again across the top, as we move into the phase two, and then into the phase three, the, those next two sections become much more focused on the scenarios themselves and the evaluation framework. And the one point that I didn't make is how are we gonna reconcile all of this? We're gonna get a lot of different information. We're gonna have groups that are gonna be focused on a lot of different interests. So we've, we're thinking we'd like to hold what we're calling these stakeholder reconciliation workshops, which will be people that have attended all of the focus groups, but representatives from each of the groups uh, to help us basically rec reconcile all of the feedback we've received to come up with a path forward. Um, there will be trade-offs, um, we know that, but there, you know, I think that this will be the one way in which we can ensure that we're not completely siloed in the way that we're having our conversations. I mean, some of these conversations, so you see the focus groups across the top, um, I think it, we feel like it's important to have some of those kind of siloed discussions to hear whatever, how everyone's feeling about this topic, what's important to them. But then we need to bring everyone together to help us reconcile the information and, and work on it together. So I think, is that my last slide, Tom? Yeah. Okay, and then this moves into, do you wanna walk through these quickly? Sure. I mean. It as we get into this next phase in terms of a, a focus, you know, we want we want to share this context like Steve has been talking about. And then as we move into the, the um, sort of demand and supply scenarios, Steve talked a little bit about the, the growth forecasts. Um, you know, we, we, we also have out there to look at, you know, again, sort of not sort of the rate of growth, but how we grow and in terms of this inclusive prosperity forecast, which, which could be more aligned with the state of Oregon's education outcomes, um, which is where this 40-40-20 concept comes, which is like if we were to grow 40% jobs that require a college degree, 40% of the jobs that require some in a, a, a community college degree or some post high school training, technical training, and then 20% of the jobs for high school graduates. You know, what would that look like? And then on the supply side, um, you know, we've talked about a little bit about the natural resource protection um, opportunities that, that, you know, again, this sort of multi-objective analysis, E-zones along the Columbia Slough, floodplain regulations along the Willamette River, uh, tree planting requirements in the heavy industrial zone. Um, there's conversions um, 
to other uses other than industrial. So, um, you know, we know out there is um, parks, as I, uh, the Parks Bureau has identified the need for a new larger um, uh, sports field complex, similar to Delta Park, that sort of matches the demand of a growing city. Um, there's not a lot of opportunities for large sites like that, um, sort of in the built up um, centers and corridors and, and residential areas. And so you have to look at some of the larger um, limited and, and quickly um, evaporating opportunities for large sites in our industrial area, but that's a competing use that, that we can look at accommodating uh, and accounting for. Um, and then, as I said earlier, you know, what are the programs, policies, maybe some map changes? We did a lot of um, research and looking for map opportunities last time around and as part of the comp plan update. Um, so those are gonna be pre pretty limited, but you know, what are the other opportunities we can, we can do to uh, expand this employment capacity? And then as we, it, you know, again, we're getting into this evaluation framework, how do we, rate, you know, look, evaluate these, the combination of supply and demand scenarios to achieve these multiple objectives. And, and we know on our, our sort of radar screen and, and we're again, looking to have this community conversation about how we define and evaluate these different policy goals uh, in terms of balancing economic opportunity, natural resource function, climate resiliency, public health, and inclusive prosperity in terms of, you know, at least coming up with a framework so that we understand if we make this decision here in terms of this combination of, of economic opportunity and resource protections, that what does that mean for all of these other objectives and a, and a way to, to, to be, begin to look at, uh, you know, across all of these policy outcomes and how we balance those outcomes um, to, to achieve all of these objectives. Um, so I think we'll stop there and take any other questions. And I, I guess I will end with, um, as I began, this is the first of many opportunities um, that we will have to brief you um, and we will be back um, multiple points and, and at the same time we want to provide an opportunity as we have with all our other major projects to have um, a few of, of the the commission members be involved in like these reconciliation workshops so you can track the progress of this but but we will also be back before you see the the um, proposed draft land in your lap um, for official public testimony and action. Oriana? Yeah, I want to start by just saying thank you. That was a lot of really dense and really interesting information that is a lot to process. Um, as I'm like chewing on this, though, I am struggling with like the assumptions that may be getting made in a couple of directions. One is the one that I think Eli has helpfully framed that I'm sure I'm guilty of to a certain extent, which is that we as members of this commission who hold jobs that require certain uh, positionality right now um, have biases because of that. And I don't wanna make assumptions about previous jobs folks have had or jobs in your family history, but also that there are assumptions that if the like industrial jobs or um, production jobs are the best jobs for uh, uh, wage mobility and prosperity for black indigenous and other communities of color, are we perpetuating that and creating a lack of mobility between job sectors because we really push people into that direction? I'm, try I'm trying to weigh these different things. So I think what would be really helpful for me as a commissioner from the community engagement perspective is if there was a, a body that we could confer with in some way in the way that when we have other like big projects where we don't necessarily have all of the expertise like design review, we talk to the design commission, we have a forestry project, we talk to the forestry commission. If we could maybe pull together like a, a body from those different focus groups or even better yet, I didn't see like a workers group. Like I would love to hear from workers in industrial jobs how they feel about those positions, uh, what their experience is. Do they like those jobs? 
Um, and understanding that anyone who would be part of a body such as that and hopefully would be resourced to do so isn't representational of an entire industry, but really hearing a worker perspective on what jobs people do want to see. Do they want to see more of or do they want to see more mobility? And I don't think that's something that we as a body necessarily are, are able to, to assess and even with the community engagement information, it would be helpful to confer and helpful to have a little bit more diverse conversation space to talk through what, what we're weighing here and not just look at the numbers, but really think about like, what do people want and what are we doing that just perpetuates, you know, the data from the past versus like what actually creates a future that people want to see. So I think it would be helpful for me if other commissioners were interested to see how do we create a body who helps us make this decision who is representational of a broader scope of interests and a broader scope of experiences and a broader scope of present class positionality than perhaps we, we have as a body. I don't know if that's possible, but I think that would be very helpful for me in, in checking my assumptions, but also checking some of the assumptions that may be coming up in this data or just in our approach to land use. And I'll close on one thing, which is that we're assuming what a college like uh, positionality job is, and one of the best practices from an equity and hiring perspective is to not ask people's educational background and just look at the life experience people have. That hugely changes the, the calculus that doesn't necessarily get captured in past data if we push to change hiring practices to be more equitable and inclusive and allow people with a high school degree but who have incredible lived experience to take a job that might otherwise, in theory and perception, require a, a higher degree that may not be necessary for success in that job. So that's just a, a closing thought of, of like what we're weighing here is a land use decision versus what are bigger changes that we might not be positioned to advocate for as a body, but necessarily may need to make changes broadly to, to expand this, this access. Yeah, I'll agree. And I'll, I'll just quickly mention that, yes, labor uh, and workers is, is, was one of those focus group boxes and and you know we recognize you know that that is a group that has not been engaged in the past that we want to engage this time around and we'll look to to see how we can bring those voices forward Jesse go ahead Jesse yeah Great. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you, Steve, Tom, and Rachel. I know that was a lot of information and thank you for distilling it and making it succinct. That was very helpful. Um, similar to what Oriana said, I'm really interested to see what the community has to say on a lot of these issues. I think they're going to be obviously the best suited to speak to a lot of this and what we want to do down the line. Um, but I'm really interested what our like regulatory options are here. Like, Are we looking at changes to the comp plan? Are we looking at just increasing industrial like land? Like what are we kind of looking at down the line? And it's probably pretty early to look at that specifically, um, but it seems like there's just gonna be a lot of interest at play here. And I'm it's a little unclear to me, like how we're gonna try and put that into some document at the end. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll try and give, um, some look to that, you know, I think the the zoning code and zoning map are a little bit limited in terms of our options. And, and you know, the best um, example that I could find or could offer up is in terms of more programs is like the emphasis on brownfield cleanup and, and super fun, which becomes more of a policy statement to council to take action um, and, and sort of create the political momentum for action. Um, you know, we tried that last time with Brownfields and, and we um, sort of ran out of political steam at the county level that, you know, the county board had to sign off on our, our Brownfield uh, tax abatement program and we didn't get it over the line. So does this whole EOA analysis provide that political momentum and, and impetus to actually achieve that this time around and here, you know, make a better case, get new political champions through this process that gets that over the line. So I really just want to thank you so much for the emphasis on middle income jobs. I've just, um, I've been kind of in as a, 
resident of East Portland, I see the middle income jobs as being really key to prosperity of, of that part of town. And it's really, and so I'm, and this is just exciting to me. I'm almost like not able to, I'm so interested in it that I'm hardly able to speak. But um, there's a couple things that I know that with something like middle income jobs, there's, it's not just a matter of the amount of land. And um, there's some other trends that are kind of bad around um, labor of recent times. I don't know if we're going to be able to get into them, but one of the, one of the things that even um, our own city government and um, like Port of Portland do this, which is the, they actually, and, and I, I mean, I think Port of Portland just the, um, the airlines do it, but um, they'll take jobs that used to not be such bad jobs or they were the entry level jobs and they spin them off into like a, 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 a corporation or, you know, so that they're completely separate like American Airlines, they would be separate from American Airlines. So those workers never have an opportunity to move up through. And um, to me, that's things like that are supporting some of these reasons why the only place you're finding middle income jobs is in industrial areas. And I, you know, I'm very much for working on this industrial land thing, but I, I'm wondering how much we're going to be able to get into those other things. Are there other, anybody else working on them? So um, that's, that's my question. Uh, that's a good question. And, and yeah, I mean, we're aware of that trend in terms of contracting and using temp workers and not offering benefits and and part-time work in this um you know part some of that stems to sort of the gig economy you know whether it's driving for uber or um other jobs that um you know that's a trend that we see and it's hard to determine you know it's sort of like airbnb right is it offering homeowners an income stream that help them stay in their home or is it taking housing off rental housing off the market it, it's difficult to tease out and um we'll we'll look at that i'm not sure how how deep we can get into those issues but We'll look for some national reports that may help us shed some light on that. It's a shame. It seems like it's hard for any one thing to get at those issues. Yeah. They seem like a real problem. Anyway, thank you so much. I was really was fascinated through the whole thing. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, um, just want to last call to and I hope I'm not putting anyone on the spot, but uh, Valerie, Gabe, or Janelle, if you have any last questions, thoughts. So I think when, once we get our, our later this spring, when we get our focus groups organized and, and we start to have these community conversations in earnest, um, we'll come back through either through the officers or, or at the beginning of the meeting and look for some of you um, to, to sort of help track this process and this conversation um, and, and to be a little more uh, involved in this building of the, the discussion draft and getting us to the proposed draft. Well, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for staying a little extra. Um, and this is, as Tom said, the first of many, um, but now let's adjourn. Thanks. Thank you.